All right, here we go. Welcome everyone, good evening. Thank you for tuning in uh, live or turning in uh, later on. We're live here with episode 53 at Pours with Patriots. Today I am joined by retired captain. That's 06 for everyone because the Navy has some different ranks. Uh, Tom Lennon. Pleasure Tom, to be here, Trey. Welcome. Absolutely pleasure to be here. It's been exciting to get to know you here in the past absolutely. hour. Absolutely. We're trying to figure out how we we we, we got here. How we got together? Absolutely. How we got here? We figured it out. We figured it out eventually. So, whiskey will do that, right? You it can does. have a cup of food, whiskey. You figure out things. So, solve the world's problems. All right. So, great story. If you haven't uh, seen any of the posts I put out, Tom has a long career. Only, I mean, it's it's all right. He only did 29 years active duty. 29 to 30. Who's no, who's counting? Yeah, right. No big deal. I mean, he couldn't he couldn't knock down 30, but I asked him if they'd let me stay till 30, and they said, Well, we'll let you stay, but not where you are. We'll send you to sea for three years or overseas for three years, retire, retain. I said, no. Nah. You're like, I'm gone. Yeah. No. And then so. they then they couldn't find a replacement for the nine months that uh they gapped it. It's terrible. Oh well. Welcome to bureaucracies. <laughs> I get, I, we'll be able to talk more about that in here a couple of hours, I think. So We'll start off with our quote here. Um, as, if you haven't noticed, we'll talk more about Tom's career from the, some of the pictures. Is he is a naval aviator, right? That's correct. Um, second, our second aviator. We had a marine aviator. Good for but our first naval aviator on here. So, this is a quote from Orville Wright: "The desire to fly is an idea handed down to us by our ancestors, who, in their grueling travels across trackless lands and prehistoric times, looked envious on the birds soaring freely through." As they should have been. Yes. Yeah. Every time I talk to a pilot, I'm kind of envious, like especially military pilots, not 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 helicopter bots, but like getting up there in the clouds, pilots. doing your thing and uh, dancing, dancing with the sky. I can't lie. I was like, before you sent me your bio, I knew you were a Navy, naval aviator. No. I can't even say that. Like <laughs> Navy aviator, naval aviator. It'll be something we mess with. I was so hoping you were going to be a Tomcat guy. I can't lie. I, That's I my generation. I was like, if this guy is a Fire Tomcat pilot, pilot I am going to be like in. I'm gonna be reliving my youth. Closest, uh, closest to being a fighter pilot uh, was I trained some of the uh, pilots that were actually in the first Top Gun, the Navy pilots that uh, you know flew the uh, aircraft for the movie. Yeah, I actually served with a bunch of uh, Tomcat uh, pilots. Yes, yeah, I think that's still for my generation. It's like the the most iconic. It was fabulous. Coolest fabulous looking, movie. Uh, we'll see the pilot. second one. It's, it's. I was a little upset. I was like, oh, Jesus, Viking guy. We'll figure it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> But uh, we'll start. We, we always start about talking about growing up. Sure. Um, you, you're like me. You were a military brat. I was. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I come from a military family. My grandfather served, uh, fought in World War One. was gassed, had white hair for the rest of his life, lived to uh, be 90. A couple of uncles that uh, served in World War Two, Army, uh, Army Air Corps and a uh, corpsman. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> my dad joined at the very end of uh, World War II, the V-12 program, and uh, eventually became an, uh, a naval aviator, a pilot. And uh, he served 27 years, retired as a commander. So I moved all around as a kid growing up and to different bases. So moving around like that, one of the things of identity, like what do you, where do you, what do you say, like where you're from growing up? Well, I was born in Ohio. I was born in Columbus, Ohio. So I'm sorry. That's what okay. I say. I, you know, my dad was stationed out on uh, San Diego. Uh, mom came back to Ohio to be with her mom to have me, and so uh, uh, Columbus is home. Uh, I went to first grade and second grade here in Columbus. He did a tour in Cincinnati. Uh, then we were off and about all over the country, and uh, I came back uh, to Columbus to go to uh, Ohio State because Dad wouldn't let me stay in Florida and uh, be near my high school sweetheart, who was a junior. He said, son, here's your options. You can come to D.C. with us, go to college there. You go up to Ohio State, uh, live with the grandparents. I said, see you, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to Ohio State. Going to Ohio yeah. State. So I always ask people to come on. Like, obviously, you have a long history of military service in your family. Did that definitely impact your decision to to join? It did. Um, when I uh, started college, I really went, had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to major in. Uh, I joined the Army ROTC my first uh, first year because I was anti-dad at the moment and uh, uh, did that. Vietnam was going on and, uh, you know, I'm watching uh, things. I didn't quite know how everything worked, but uh, I, I started to think, yeah, I want to fly, but I don't think I want to fly uh, helicopters in Nam. I, you know, if I'm going to fly, 
you know, what do I want to do? And I decided I wanted to fly the Navy off of ships. I figured, you know, if you're going to be, that to me seemed to be the epitome of being a, a, a pilot. Yeah, that's, um, so the, your ROTC, I was going to give you a hard time about that. You that's did, okay. you, you were right for one year and then, one year, you know, the rest, then of, I changed. The rest yeah. of your uh, 32 years of your career. No, I, um. I did, I did that May Day <laughs> Parade uh, Corps where we had thousands of uh, uh, cadets and midshipmen uh, on the Oval. That was one of so, the last ones. So great. when you went ROTC, Army, was it really a, like an F you to dad or was it something? Yeah, it really that, was. It okay. really was. I mean, I, I knew I would do well in ROTC regardless of which ROTC I did because I just had a vent for the pension for that. Uh, but uh, uh, I decided I'd fly and go to the Navy. So I went to the Navy at, at, in uh, winter quarter and uh, talked to the uh, lieutenant. And he first thing out of his, so there were 10,000 Army ROTC students. There were 300 Navy. The first thing out of his mouth was, what's your grade point? I told him, and he says, why don't you go away and do a little better and then come back and talk to us? Oh. Like, Ooh. So, so I did. So the, uh, uh, quarter fresh spring quarter, my freshman year was the best grade point I ever had. It was like a three, three, but anyway, uh, <laughs> and I came back and said, Hey, I want to join you. And he said, well, why don't you do our two year programs? No, I get A's in ROTC. I'll do that. So I doubled up their uh, program. I started as a contract student, did two years as a contract my sophomore year, uh, the PNS uh, said, uh, hey, I got an appointment at the Naval Academy. Would you like to go there? I'm going, uh, no, I like girls at that point. I didn't want to start all over as a, you have to go through four more years. So uh, uh, I got a Navy scholarship for my last two years uh, in the program. So this is jumping ahead. Somebody just threw a, uh, a, a comment in here. We have to address it because it's jumping ahead 29 years or so, but somebody just posted that they regret not being here tonight for a hell of an episode that you were his commander at the Naval JRTC program at Franklin Heights. So uh, someone's listening. Uh, well, you did terrific. that for 18 years? I did that for 18 years. Absolutely. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, love doing it. Yeah, it's one of our board members, Joe. He didn't go in the Navy, he went in the Marine Corps though. So I don't know how much of an effect you had on him. Terrific. You got him through that, Joe Smith? Joe Smith. Joe Smith. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he did a great job getting him through what well, he did. He's, we'll, we'll have to hook up sometime and uh, definitely, yeah. re reconnect. Yeah. Today's his son's birthday. That's why he's missing it. Ah, well, so. that's a good reason to miss it. It is, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So we'll talk about, you know, you. this is 19, so it's 19, you, you go through Army, uh, you go through so Army ROTC, three years of Navy ROTC. Yeah, but I crammed four years of Navy ROTC in three years, so I really did five years of ROTC. Does that really show how easy Navy ROTC is, though? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. Okay. Oh, good. I like that. But no, my roommate was a Navy <laughs> ROTC guy. It's not easy. I, I I was like, man, we just go out on the field and do stuff. He's like charting shit in the room. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this definitely I'm definitely in the right branch here. <laughs> um but so you, you get commissioned in 1971. 71, that's correct. A year before I was born. I just want to throw that thank out to the, the guests. Uh, for... Thank you for being here and uh, your yeah. service. And uh, yes, you are young. I don't know. With all that I'm gray, really not, though. All that gray in your beard. I'm not sure. It's it's. I put that in there to look a little older. It's, it's no more not. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. I'm not young anymore. That's the funniest thing. But um, but we're never old. You're only old if you think you are. I feel like I'm getting old, though. Yeah, but you really I think it's the atmosphere. Like, so I, I shared with you before, the Vietnam era guy. Yeah. Or the, or the tail end of it, I went to a Vietnam, you know, ceremony on last Friday to, to volunteer somewhere. And it was the first time it hit me that, like, the Vietnam veterans are now the World War II veterans, and I'm the Vietnam veterans. You know what I mean? It was like, damn, I'm old. Like, you know what I mean? It used to be like there was my dad and you guys in between us, and it was them. Now I'm like, it's now me. Oh, yeah. man, I'm going to be the guy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Begging for twenty percent off on my meal. Oh, I always, free I always ask. <laughs> Absolutely, all I can do is say no. <laughs> That's always a knock to my dad. My my dad loves a discount. Absolutely, loves a military discount. Okay. Um, he said I only made it my freshman year. I think he said so. I think it's probably Joe again. So. Okay. You, you weeded him out then. I Good must job. have. Yeah, he, weeded him out. He self, um, self chose. So nineteen seventy one, like you said, like back to flying though. So okay. when did when did you get the flying bug? Was that when did you know you want well, to fly? Like I said, I, my dad had been a pilot, so uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do in college. And when I decided, uh, probably my sophomore year in college, or, or decided, well, let's let's become a Navy pilot. And uh, uh, I really did not have any personal flying experience. Uh, I didn't take any uh, aeronautical programs at the uh, school that they right. now have. Um, it was just uh, a means to an end, so to speak. And so. Uh, well, okay, let's do it. And I got commissioned and uh, 
uh, was fortunately selected for a, a pilot program. Of course, it's during Vietnam, so training is fast and furious. Right. Uh, you were talking about it aging this brings back another story i didn't tell you about so in high school when i'm down there we're living on the base and i'm watching all of the uh aviation candidates go through the uh cross-country course through the sand the obstacle course and all that and i'm sitting out there watching them and chuckling at times and uh i had one guy one day come up to me and says so uh, you think this is uh this is easy. I said, yeah, I, I was in sports and everything. It was pretty easy. And he says, yeah, wait till you go to college for four years and party and everything. Go back and try and do this. Well, he was pretty, he was right. <laughs> so back to high school, did you play any sports in high school? I uh, did uh, a little, a uh, little football uh, in uh, my uh, <clears throat> junior, senior year. And, uh, and then a little uh, cross country running, that kind of stuff. Wasn't a serious athlete, uh, yeah, but uh I did three different high schools, so you know there was no continuity in that. But uh, it's right, right, yeah, it's hard to move around and right. and find a team thing. So, so your dad, how many years? Twenty seven. Twenty seven. So, what did he fly? He started out uh, in uh, TBMs, torpedo bombers, and okay. uh, then he did uh, some bug smashing, uh, twin engine uh, prop planes, and then uh, helicopters. At one time, he had uh, held a uh, an altitude record for. Uh, uh, getting a helicopter on up uh, 14,000 feet at the time, which was a record. Uh, so torpedo bomb, we were talking about prop, yeah, like the all, like he was all props. like midway movie yeah, dropping exactly, like exactly that kind of stuff. Look at that! I know my aviation there. Very good. Like, I aviation the movie. That. Just dropping in there. That, that seems like a that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy stuff. So do you, do you give him crap about? Did you ever give him crap about serving a couple more years in him? No, not well. Never picked at him? Well, of course I picked at him. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, he retired a commander. I mean, captain. I mean, you know, I had operational <laughs> command. You know, he did. Yeah, we, there was there was some ribbing and all that kind of good stuff. And like, you know, now my, my son just retired 29 in the Army, and he's always ribbing me. You know, I'm in the wrong service and all that. And Army-Navy game is always fun. Not yeah, but you years. tell your son you just but you need to call me sir like he's a, he's a warrant officer but his, he, his, his, me, he, me, he says call me chief okay yeah. all right chief yeah his son is a, a retired cw4 Correct. u.s army right so i think we'll talk about him a little bit later okay. but um so you head down to flight school pensacola yep, yep. Learn to fly your first Learned aircraft. Learn to fly. Start out uh t-34s uh softly field uh then you went out and uh, jumped in the T-28, which was uh, the intermediate prop plane at the time. i got to tell you, T-28 uh, Trojan, uh, when I first saw it, single-engine prop plane, God, this is a beast. I had to jump up to grab the handhold to get myself pulled up to get in the cockpit and everything. I, that was the only airplane I've ever flown that I was physically intimidated the first time I took a look at it. And uh, I'm a properly statured kind of guy, you know, like a giant like yourself. <laughs> put your leg over the cockpit but it was a it was rattle it no uh so i did that and then uh you go through uh that phase of training and then you get to you know the exciting part you know they they take you to vt5 for uh carrier qualifications and you're going to be a naval aviator you you, you got to land on carriers and uh, so you train and you go out and land on carriers that was yeah so i exciting. looked at a stat you said this as we talked about this you have over 700 carrier, carrier landing mm -hmm. And five thousand flight hours, so yeah. seven hundred yeah. carry landing. It's like so. The first time you do that, like talk that back. Like we had, we had a Harrier guy in, so it's a little bit different. You know, mm -hmm. he's, yeah. you know, like, but like, what is it really like? You know, we've all I've, I've seen plenty of documentaries where. Well, I'll tell you, I'll the, you the people stories, are naval but, aviators are doing, but like, what is it? Or marine aviators as well? What is it? Well, what is it like? Marine aviators that uh, a lot of them qualify also for right. a carrier. So the very first very first attempt at a carrier landing, guy died right in front of me. You know, you go on out. We'd had uh, the the wives all made scarves. You know, the World War One uh, scarf that you wrap around your neck, and you're going out to pre-flight the airplane, and your the nerves are up, you know, way high, and uh, apprehension and everything. And uh, so my scarf ended up coming off and going into my uh, my flight suit. And uh, we went out, and uh, you go out, and you have a, a lead lead instructor pilot takes you out to the uh, the ship in formation overhead and it's your time to come in he leads you in he leaves goes back up overhead you get into the pattern um 800 feet break down to 600 feet flaps gear 
tail hook on down. But you get two passes at the uh, at the carry of the first time, no tail hook, just to come on in, practice, get the nerves out. Right. Uh, and in a prop, they give you a cut sign when you get in. You cut the engine, and then you know you do the touch and go, add power and go. Um, <clears throat> so we do those. The guy ahead of me had uh, been having some problems at the field. And earlier that day, they had a, a gent do his uh, deck run. First, first, we're not catapults. We, you know, you put the brakes on, run the power on up, roll down that uh, flight deck. You get to the elevator on the Lexington, rotate, and the rudder shakers, the stall shaker, the rudders are shaking like this, and you fly through that, take off, get the pattern, come on back around. Um, a jet had uh, gone out, didn't rotate enough, went off the bow of the ship, settled, got into ground effect, didn't crash into the water, but uh, they they disqualified him and sent him back to the field. That word got back, and so they're beating into us. You know, make sure that when you uh, when you take off, you rotate. You know, the proper visual picture is put the oil coolers on the horizon, that and then fly that sight picture on up to altitude and turn back down. All right, so we do that. The gen ahead of me, Stephen Fink, and I'm bad with names. I am bad with names. I admit that it's uh, failing. Uh, he uh, he's in the pattern ahead of me. And he's rolling in, and he has his hook down. He grabs a wire. And I go, oh, way to go, Stephen. I was real happy for him because there was a question whether they would let him go out. And so I said, okay, Tom, get your act together. Focus on what you're doing. So you come around. You fly across the wake. You're coming because you, you got an angle deck. You're coming on in. You're trying to keep the uh, meatball lined up with the datum lights. And uh, you're, you're coming on in, you know, flying it on in, and... LSO gives you a cut signal, and you cut, and you come on in, and the eye landed too long. He goes, boulder, boulder, you already, you know, put the power to the plane, took off, you turn, it's 11 degree offset, I'm climbing, turning. Stephen had done his deck run and had over-rotated, and they show you know, the accident movies that you see, and uh, you learn how to drive, you know, speed and all that stuff. They show us a bunch of crash accidents in, in training command. And he had done a hammerhead stall, was falling right into me. I had to turn to avoid his plane hitting me. Looked over my shoulder, I could see the splash, no ejection seat. This is the old Dilbert Dunker, get out. Splash, he hit the water, plane sank in 22 seconds. They put us overhead while they searched for him. He was gone. Uh, and um, you're, you're solo, there's no instructor pilot with you. And, um, and then they bring us back into the pattern. I got six more approaches. I made six arrested landing. I can't tell you a darn thing about any one of those, but I, I vividly still see today right. that particular situation. So is there any, carrier so, aviation. So what I mean, what does that do to you? Is it like are you are you scared shitless? Are you thinking like did I do the right? I mean, am great, I great question? Yeah. So um, later on, I, I became a flight instructor and I was a carrier carrier instructor, and we would. Uh, go over all procedures and the practice and all that. And I would, I would tell that story to my students and I'd tell them, look, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is not how good a pilot I am. What I'm trying to tell you is how good the training is that you can overcome adversity. And that's what the military is all about. And that's what we're, that's what we're teaching you to do because anybody can fly an airplane. If you're going to go into combat, you're going to have emergency system failures, things like that. We need people that can, understand what they're doing and uh, you know get the bird back home if they can get the mission complete that's a that's a rough 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 thing to say in your first go around it was pretty pretty exciting <laughs> yeah i mean so and, back up let's talk about the scarves because i just saw fly yeah. fly boys like okay. the world war one yep, yep. thing and I, I i remember seeing that years ago when i rewatched it recently so what was the intent of the scarves originally it was just to um show solidarity with uh aviators and the why you know the wives and girlfriends made them for us and had the tassels had your initials in them you know okay. it was a silk scarf that you just you know put around your neck going out like uh you know uh, snoopy or whatever and uh off you go and, uh, but like i said that first time when you're 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 getting ready to head out uh it was uh, so much apprehension and everything that right. i didn't need i didn't need anything else around my neck you still have it no i don't i don't it's somewhere basically <laughs> but i don't i don't know like where is that scarf? Yeah. Huh? 
that's crazy. So, so you 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 now you you're qualified to land on the carriers. On the carriers, yeah. So what's what's next for Tom? Well, then Tom went and uh, wait. Before we get into that, holy cow! What is your call sign? Which one do you want? Okay. Oh, holy cow! It's gonna be good. Oh, yeah, there you Ooh, go. Let's okay. go with your first call sign. Like first what's your call first sign, like first squadron that I I didn't really have one in the training command uh, as a student, you know. But then uh, when I eventually got to my very first squadron, the uh, uh, one of the enlisted uh, admin. I was uh, admin on public affairs, legal affairs, classified material. And um, he thought I reminded him of Lieutenant Fuzz from Beetle Bailey. And so, you know, you have no say in your own call sign. And all of a sudden I became Fuzz. So uh, I was Fuzz for that, <laughs> Fuzz for that tour. When I ended up going to the training command to uh, be a flight instructor, I changed that call sign. <laughs> You're like, I can make a death change. Now. I can. Uh, I'm going to be the guy in charge now. And uh, so uh, the family raised uh, show beagles while uh, I would go to sea and everything. And so uh, I called myself Beagle. Okay. So I was Beagle one forever. I got to uh, down the road. I was. Uh, uh, when you're in the, the, the squadron's call sign, BS-28 was Gambler, so I was Gambler 2 when I was the XO, Gambler 1 when I was the CO. And when I went, so I, I thought Gambler would be a good call sign to keep going and everything, but Beagle. And, uh, Had a great song. Yeah, it was. And then I got to uh, the uh, Air, Wing st uh, sta uh, Air Wing staff uh, as a training officer and then eventually chief staff officer. Uh, uh, the operations officer renamed me gouge it was either good gouge or bad gouge depending on gouge gouge <laughs> so I, that's why i say depends on what you know some guys have a call sign I, can, yeah, but this, uh, I mean i like buzz buzz is a good one yeah, i mean yeah yeah I, I, I feel like yeah I, i've heard that too like you don't get to choose your, no, your you call don't. sign so you but you got beagle beagle i mean that's i like buzz though i mean yeah. fuzz, gouge is a fuzz fuzz but i just said buzz, buzz. buzz. Yeah. i don't know why i said yeah. that so, buzz. Yeah, lieutenant fuzz that yeah that's sort of different a, that's that, different that was a little bit uh derogatory yeah yeah if you put, that's you a little know, bit different yeah i i didn't yeah you catch look that. at the character in beetle bailey with the you know the blonde hair and the the, the weird guy and all that no, no. beetle bailey was a great cartoon oh, i love beetle bailey it, was a great it is a great character it is it is the lazy beetle bailey that you didn't think that would ever happen and they're everywhere yep, yep. whatever generation so you, you know you go out you that you you're going your first carrier at that point right yep after you're so carrier after, qualified so after so you get you you get uh then you go to advanced training i did that in uh uh corpus christi texas and then uh there were 10 guys that had orders the week i got my orders i wanted to go to a seagoing outfit Seven of them went to uh, P3s, land-based four-engine planes. Three of us got the VS community, which were S2s at the time. Uh, two weeks before that, everybody was getting desk jobs. The next two weeks after that, mostly desk jobs. So I was very fortunate. Timing is everything in the military. You know, if uh, you hit things at the right time, you do your job right and everything, you're going to be successful. I was fortunate. I got I got a C going out bit. So that's two. What does that aircraft do? It's a uh, anti-submarine. It was a twin engine uh, propeller plane, uh, originally based at uh, Quonset Point, Rhode Island, chase, uh, so, chase submarines. And it had, you know, we find s submarines visually, mostly with sound, sauna buoys, uh, magnetic detection, uh, maybe electronic uh, things. Uh, of course, the uh, the S two had a searchlight, you know, seventy million county power uh, searchlight, you know, which is like on every car now. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> great. So uh, anyway, uh, I was. So how many crew on that? Is it just two? Four. Okay. There were four. Okay. There were two pilots and two enlisted uh, operators in the back seats, and then uh, uh, went to. Uh, Eventually, they closed Quonset. We went to Jacksonville, uh, Cecil Field, uh, flew the S-2 there for a while. I actually was a part of a crew that ferried some uh, uh, military surplus to uh, Venezuela. Neat stories and all that. And then eventually went to the uh, the S-3 Viking, where I had most of my uh, fly hours. So the Viking also anti-submarine? Anti-submarine. Okay. It, it was a three officer crew, one enlisted, as opposed to two and two. So the, the the guys, the officer in the back, and then list the person. They're the one doing all the actually yeah, they, hunting stuff, or well, they yeah, they, how does uh, that work? The the 
tactical coordinator would have been an officer in the back who was charge of the finding the submarines and that kind of stuff. Uh, where we're going to put the uh, uh, Masana buoys, you know, working the data link, you know, all that kind of good stuff. The uh, enlisted uh, sensor operators doing, and, and we could multitask. You could do radar and. Uh, the neat thing about the S3, it had early versions of the infrared. So, man, that's a neat, neat system to see. And uh, you can operate that from the co pilot seat, TACO seat, or the enlisted sensor seat. And the enlisted guy mostly would be listening, analyzing the sounds, trying to uh, detect uh, submarine noises, machinery noises, propellers, water flow, that kind of stuff. So normally the same crew of four, or did you guys switch it around? You'd switch it around, but usually you would you would have a crew assigned, uh, but then you know depending on if somebody was sick or anything like that, you can you know get get other people rode in. So the, did you like having your set crew? Or yeah, I did, and uh, I was again time is everything. When I was in the uh, the S three first squadron, uh, my squadron was uh, picked to evaluate the naval flight officer co-pilot. So instead of having two pilots up front, we had a one pilot, naval flight officer who was not certified as a naval a, you know, aviator to fly the plane, uh, but he served as a co-pilot. And then uh, we would, uh, so we had seven of those in our, in our squadron. And usually they're gonna go to the seven senior guys, you know how that stuff works. Well, uh, in my case, the CO said, "Look, we're going to we're going to do that across the, uh, the spectrum of our our crews." From I was the junior plane commander, qualified to take have a crew and everything, and so I, he gave me one of those as well as himself and the operations and that kind of stuff. So I'm for that deployment. I'm a single piloted uh, um, crew. Didn't have another pilot with me. My, my naval flight officer had civilian flight time as a pilot, so it's pretty Did simple. you have to fly the plane, though? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, good. so <laughs> yeah, you, you have the stick. Like, don't tell anybody you can. I'm going to let right. you. That's right. No, you're, you're, here's the plan. You're going to land on the aircraft carrier this time. <laughs> yeah, it's your turn. Just as, <laughs> <laughs> no, that we don't. No, you get, and you're going to do it at night. <laughs> Everyone's like, holy shit, Tom better be able to land this thing because we got no we got no backup. I love it. That's that's kind of crazy that the co-pilot no no not a flight guy. Yeah. So, well, you know, you're all trained to be able to fly these, you know, the military right. aircraft and everything. And most most of them are single piloted, and yeah. so uh, it worked out. You were talking about what's it like to uh, uh, land on a carrier. So, so we're we're on one of the I, I can't remember which deployment it is, but I think it was that first one, and we're in the uh, off of, uh, off of uh, France and uh, big sea swells, big swells coming in. In the pattern, set up to come in and land, and the uh, the enlisted uh, operator is looking out his seat, the uh, ship, and he says, "Oh my God, look at that ship move!" And it, I mean, it's it's going twenty feet up, twenty feet down. And all that. I say, "Okay, uh, why don't you be quiet back in the peanut gallery? You know, with the, you know, we'll, we'll we'll get it aboard and we'll be okay." You're like, "No shit!" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was talking about something about flying and. Um, I was flying that like my old job used to fly a lot, and we we're, we're gonna. I think we're going to LaGuardia, and it was like North Carolina, LaGuardia, and it like I've flown a lot in a lot of planes, and I was like, okay, I'm comfortable. Like, there's only certain things you get like nervous, but right. this flight was one of like the small American airline regional, so this thing is all over the place. And I'm right. like, oh my, and so like you know, you're, you, I'm looking out the window, and I swear to God, like before you saw the ground, there it was like ten feet above yeah. before you saw anything. And as soon as we land, everybody's like clapping and yeah. like, you know, oh my God, you know, and then the flight attendant's like, hey, everybody, um, let's give another round of applause for these pilots because they earn, you know, they earn their wings today. And like, we get out of the plane and the one guy, the one pilot, I was like, just sitting there. <laughs> I mean, I'm, how did I'm we like, pull, how do we pull that I'm off? I'm like, thank God I didn't have to do it because yeah. I mean, there's no way I'd be like, hey, can I go land somewhere else? <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, after, uh, after 30, 40 day landings, yeah. Day landing's got to be fun. Yeah, it, it's pretty pretty basic. It gets exciting and you you love just doing them. Night landings on an aircraft carrier, I don't care how much experience you have, will always work. Always. Like they, they keep talking about that and it's it's true. It just yeah. is. Like when did you like you so is it like third like when did you feel comfortable like you know, landing on the like I said, after about 30, 30, yeah, you start feeling like, like that. Yeah, I said, okay, I can do this. I'm okay with this. Uh, you know, you had the 
procedures down, the patterns down. You you knew how the bird would uh, right. you know, perform and everything. But uh, like I said, you know those night landings <laughs> and it's, it's all instruments and the uh, now the the F eighteen the newer planes. You know they can hook them up uh, automatically and they'll come in uh, and land themselves. Uh, you hear that, guys? It's easier to fly an F-18 than it was to yeah, fly the, right. the Viking. Yeah, we he were, just uh, threw it out to all you guys. I just threw it out to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we were certified drop, down no. to, a, to a, a quarter of a mile where you could be coupled up, but you were not allowed to fly it all the way to a touchdown. It just wasn't certified. So, you know, you, you always had to break it out and land the... the like your scary... Thing. What was your scariest that you remember, like, Tom shit in his... Or Fuzz oh, yeah. shit in his pants, like, I... Can I fly like oh, 80 miles or 100, yeah. 2,000 miles and so, land on the ground? So I'm, uh, we're in the middle of the Atlantic on a, going across the Mediterranean. And I've been out on a, a double cycle. And so, you know, cycle's about a half, 45 minutes. So my flight's three and a half to four hours. It's nighttime. And I come back in and uh, weather all around us. I mean, thunderstorms, that kind of stuff. And uh, there is, there's nowhere to go. You know, that's home right there. You know, we're, you're not diverting anywhere. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to get back here. They're driving it, uh, you know, trying to keep it wind across the deck and all that without getting pulled into a thunderstorm, which is trying to suck us in because of the wind and all that. <clears throat> and I came on in and um, I'm flying it. And I was, uh, I think I was the lieutenant commander, so I was uh, I, I'm pretty experienced at this time. And uh, we had a crosswind, which you don't ever have on carriers, very seldom, to, to try and keep us from, again, sucking into this thunderstorm. And uh, having flown props helped me because I could fly wing down top rudder to keep the thing on center line. And I managed to grab, grab a wire, not have to go around, or, and then we kept going where we had to go and everything. That's probably one of the scariest uh, uh, landings I had to do. So did you have a real co-pilot with you or like? No, that was, uh, I had, uh, that was transitioned down the road. I was single pilot. Okay. Uh, the. Uh, so it was just you, you yeah. had to land it. Yeah, just me. Yeah. No big deal. So, no big deal. He's uh, like, no big deal. I just said it 700 times. So that's no big deal. It was uh, one of the things that uh, was always a challenge. You know, they, they teach you all along don't hit anything, you know, you know, you're, you're doing formation flying and everything. And, you know, you get close, you watch the blue angels, the thunderbirds and all that. They do great stuff now. Okay. Now we want you to go in and hit something. Okay. And, uh, doing that, doing that at night, doing that weather, it should be a challenge. Yeah. They, they, that, that's always, I've seen that from the, the refueler yeah. few, and then I also got to see that from a C5 actually okay. getting refueled. I'm like, no, I'm yeah. not doing that. This is crazy. <laughs> it is. It, I mean, it's, it, it's just nuts. It's, it, it's crazy. It, anything like I always laugh with, with when you see things, if especially the military, you, you see something on TV and you're kind of like, this is crazy. And then, it, or, it or sometimes looking, it looks so easy. Like you see refueling, like right. you see videos of all the time, like everybody just like the plane just coming up and like everything's looking great. And I'm like, the times I saw, it didn't seem like it was that. Yeah. Nobody was that relaxed. You know, you see like the videos of guys like holding like exactly. a, a, a magazine yeah. or mess around, but these people are like, they're, the, they're the pilot I was watching was down. like, yeah. It was, it, yeah. I mean, I, I've told, I don't know if I've told a story here, but I was on the way over, it was a C5 going over to Afghanistan. And there was a, like, I was, I went up to the cockpit and I'm talking, there's two captains. I'm a captain at the time. And, and there's, I noticed there's a guy sleeping, you know, and, and you know, over there and i'm like well what's what's his deal and they're like oh that's you know he's gonna refuel the plane i'm like like seriously guys we can't do it and they're like no we can't like the one yeah, guy's like i've only been flying this thing for like <laughs> yeah they were all like <laughs> i just got on this aircraft i'm like whoa wait a second here like so i and i'm thinking they're fucking with me yeah. because they're you know we in the military you screw with each you other do. so it, he's like wake this guy wake the major up so i wake him up and he gets up he starts stretching i'm like no wait, really what's your deal and he's like i'm really gonna my job is to like stick this fuel for like like 55 minutes they had to, they had to get yeah. fuel and i'm like that's it and he's like i'm like why can't these guys do it and he's and he just goes these two can't do it <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but i'm like so you basically get around the plane to to refuel he's like yep that's my job to get it. like these guys can't do any and he, he poked at him a little bit it was actually pretty fun to listen to him yeah. give him a hard time but missing the missing the wire okay like you missed that yep. do you guys give each other shit about oh, that absolutely. okay i, I want to make sure like is there a lot of absolutely. shit talking oh, oh yeah yeah so every 
pass, every landing on a carrier, touch and go, rested landing, bolter, <laughs> everyone is graded. Uh, and it can be an okay, it can be a it can be a good, it can be a fair, it can be a no grade, it can be a bolter. You hang a little bolt on you have a you have a scoreboard in the ready room. And you know, pilot's name, and then you have all these symbols, you know, how they did. And you want to see all green. You know, maybe occasional yellow, maybe you don't want to see red, you don't want to see bolts. And so uh But if you see red bolts, you landed though, right? If red you landed, but it was not, not it wasn't pretty, a bolter you missed and had to okay, go around okay. and get, get it again. But the red, I mean you still landed though. You still landed. Let me tell you again, the uh bolter. So uh flight instructing and uh student uh, aviators, because they're making all these landings at you know uh, at the field, flying the lens and all that. But and so the question that everybody comes up, how will I know if I bolt? And I go. <laughs> My answer to that was, you will know immediately. It's like sitting on a toilet with the seat up. You know immediately something's wrong. You react or you're going to get your ass wet. <laughs> and it's really a good, it's a good analogy. Yeah, that's true. I, I, you're going to go off the end like, yep. and it's over. <laughs> so you you miss. Always, so as soon as you touch down, you always 100% power in jets. So any like inside like... Hard, hard time like betting on who has the best landings or well, the worst landing oh, did you guys like i mean yeah, oh yeah so uh you always wanted to be be good i started out i wasn't good i really wasn't all that good the through my first first squadron deployment i was okay but i wasn't good and i'd made it a goal that i wanted to be good uh when i went and became a flight instructor that was sort of like a graduate course in flying in aviation and uh, you learn an awful lot. So then when I went and uh, was uh, at an air wing staff, but still flying the S3, uh, on that deployment, I was good. He's like, he just missed his eyes. He's like, well, the, uh, yeah, I got the, I got the he's got patch. a flight jacket to prove it, guys. I got the patch that shows. He's got the shit right there. Look at that. And Boom. Top hook right there. That was the top hook on the USS Constellation for one of the line periods. I had the best landing grades of all the pilots for that particular evaluation he's like yeah read that take that sucker he's like take that f8 take that f18 (laughs) hornet that lands by itself (laughs) so anyway so you wanted to be you you did everybody yeah competition all the time and uh, but you also want to reinforce and you know uh support everybody and you know sometimes people have bad days well i gotta imagine like i mean like you said like from i've seen and like talking to a couple people that you're you're not the first aviator to talk to about it but like there's generally that's like the it's from the people I've talked to, that's the scariest and like where the most, you know, can go wrong pretty quick. So quick. yeah, I, I can imagine that you want to make it as light as it can be, but also as serious as, can, as serious as it can be as you're doing it. You know what right. I mean? Cause you want to, you want to be pushing people to get better because obviously the better you are, the less chances that you're going to have and you want to learn a problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you know, they, they want open and honest feedback when you do something wrong, something dumb. Yeah. Uh, so that somebody else doesn't do it. Like if you're red all the way through, does any like you're still flying though, right? They're not like you can't fly anymore. They're still like um, you just suck at landing. That's it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's as long as they will keep you because they got a lot of money invested in you. Mm-hmm. You know, until you uh, show that you shouldn't be trusted. Yeah. So you ready for now? You still you still sipping there? I'm still sipping. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, we got we got to get the old granddad. We got to get the old granddad. I'll get to it. I don't want to force you there. He's like, he's going to like, oh, I'll drink you, man. He's like, I went to tail hook. Okay. We got to get into that, by the way. Bend it. <laughs> you see Tom, he just put that down. I'm like, oh, we're doing it. No. So you, you, so how long were you, your first, before you went to, you kind of jumped ahead a little bit where we went to, but you, where do you want to go next? You're flight instructing. You want to go there? Where do you want to go next? Well, I talked about the flight instructing. Uh, Was there any bit. pilots that were just like, you look at them and be like, Jesus, we should not have let you fly. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> we're going to get uh, down the road, I suspect, uh, Bobby Goodman, who is a naval flight officer who was uh, shot down in uh, the Pacaw Valley strike. He had started as a pilot going through. Uh, he wasn't my student, but he was in the squadron. Just just didn't quite have it and had, uh, had to have an evaluation board. And a decision was made, nope, you're... After many extra flights, 
this isn't the pathway for you. So they ended up making him, gave him the option to go become a naval flight officer, uh, intercept operator, that kind of stuff. And uh, he did. He was he was successful in that. But <clears throat> yeah, so, so yeah, I've seen people, you know, not make it. <clears throat> you want to give them as much opportunity as you can. You try you try to weed them out as early as you can. Uh, before you get more money invested in right. that kind of stuff. This is a military way. And, uh, so it usually weeds them out, just what's just not... Their performance, whether they're following procedures, whether they're uh, <clears throat> memorizing their emergency procedures. Some people have better hand-eye coordination than others. And uh, uh, <clears throat> formation flying in particular weeds out a fair number. Carrier landings would be that one. I had uh, so flight instructing... Got my first gray hair as well as a flight instructor. Um, take off. <clears throat> We've got a guy. I'm riding. It's a safe for solo formation check flight. And so we're going to go up and rendezvous on another plane. And <clears throat> we take off and plane's up there. He's in an orbit. And my guy's coming at him. But, uh, you use radius of turn, you know, uh, to close. Well, he had not pulled the power back since takeoff, and so we have lots of closure, lots, lots of smack going, and I'm just, I'm going, okay, then, so how far am I going to let this go? I'm, but it's safe for Solo, you know, he's, I'm supposed to not do anything unless he's going to get us killed, which he would have done. Uh, and uh, so as we're... <laughs> As we're closing in with 50 knots of closure, which is way more than you want to have, the the Marine Major instructor in the lead planes, I can see his eyes getting big. And uh, I'm just, I'm saying, okay, no, he doesn't recognize. So I took the plane and we underran him and uh, just went way outside and uh, all this. You know, he would have, he would have run right into the guy, you know, and had a mid-air collision with both of them, killed, killed everybody there. So, that's it. We're done. You're done for the day. So what did you, what, what's that, what's his reaction after you tell him that? I said, we talk about, did you see the closure you had? You know, in formation flying, relative motion is everything. You know, you can be going 500 miles an hour, 700 miles an hour. And, you know, as long as you matched, there's, you know, you get the little bumps and all that kind of good stuff, but there's no relative motion. When you have lots of relative motion, you know, you got to, you got to be able to be, see it, be aware of it, know how to react to it, and what you got to do to correct it. Uh, he did not have that situational awareness in that time. He got some additional flights, but he eventually, he didn't make it. <laughs> you're like, you're not doing a great job yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go down on the ground and you say, okay, you know. Hey, yeah, I think it's like, I got to equate how stressful it is to like be in a car with your kid. And, and you're, and you, and you're not like yeah. you, you want to just reach over there and do something. I can't imagine you're in a plane like I want to wait to the last minute before it's too late, and then let me let me get control of that. Um, yeah. I'd be like, how about we just? Uh, yeah, that's definitely not. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a. I mean, I got a lot of props for you doing that. I yeah. Mean, it's it's part of how they uh, you know they train you. It's like it's yeah. like everything that that we do. You know, in the military, you know they they give you the training, the skill sets to be successful in what you're what you're uh, assigned to do it's up to you then to execute it's whether you got to do it or not that's yeah. right so you ready to go over your featured whiskey sure we'll take a break okay. here from this from the tom story and we'll we'll get into your first i'm excited what you brought okay because ogd 114 is like is old school like it's og ogd is og yeah. right so Tom brought old granddad 114, which is a Jim Beam product. You got an empty glen over there? Just not too much because I just okay. I just slammed that last one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You were like, his eyes were watering a little bit. You guys didn't see that, but it's fine. He fought through it. That's right. Um, Thank you, sir. But this is a, a, like a classic Jim Beam product, I call it. I mean, it's one of those, like, we told a story before the podcast, but this is like always was in my house for a long time. And, um, What's interesting about it, we'll talk a little bit, but it, it does come from Jim Beam, which which is located in Claremont, Kentucky. Um, as we talked about before, Jim Beam produces some of the most iconic names in, um, in whiskey and bourbon. Um, what's great about that is they have had eight generations of uh, family distillers at Beam right now. Um, the newest, Jimmy, or Freddie took over in uh, 2002, I think. 
So that's the eighth generation family um, distiller. Um, Jim Bean, the name comes from um, an, uh, 1943 when they honored uh, James B. Beam, who basically rebuilt the business after Prohibition. Uh, and the distillery right now and Jim Beam is all owned by uh, the Suntory Holdings, and they, they bought that in 2014. But Old Granddad um, 114 is named after Basil Hayden. I don't know if you I, like no, with Basil I, Hayden. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I forgot I knew that, but yeah, but he was, you know, Meredith Basil Hayden Sr., which is known to everybody in the world as Basil Hayden. Uh, Basil Hayden's kind of introductory um, whiskey or bourbon that that that, uh, that comes into market, 80 proof, lower proof, but they do some great stuff. But the, 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 the brand itself dates back to years before Prohibition. Um, it was one of actually some of the first uh, whiskey that was distilled at some of the old, one of the oldest uh, distillers in Kentucky. The 114 line came around in the 70s. Okay. So it's kind of old school. I didn't realize yeah. it was that yeah. old. Okay. Yeah, the, seven, the 114 came around in the 70s. It was actually introduced by national distillers who used to own the brand um, before. So there's other, two other offerings for this. There's an 86 proof. And there's also a bottle and bond 100 proof. But 114, I think, is my favorite of them okay. the, the 100 is great for mixing drinks okay, yeah. if you if you're big into mixing drinks that love it in a manhattan or an old-fashioned as well but uh what's it, what's interesting about this one this mash bill actually uses the high rye mash bill from jim bean which is the same thing that basil hayden uses okay. so a lot of people talk about old granddad as being a cheaper version of basil hayden not much I, now what's liquor store today it's not much cheaper okay. it used no, to be no, but no. nothing's cheaper anymore yeah <laughs> anymore, uh, exactly i was right. like wow basil hayden is what got more expensive basil I, I, it was trying to figure it out but um it does use the high right right mash bill and, and that goes back to again when basil hayden was distilling at the at the time he was using um a higher rye mash bill which was not normal at the time so old grand granddad is great it's non age stated 114 proof hence the 114 yep. um and this mash bill is 63 percent corn 27 percent rye and 10 percent malted barley cool and I it's a classic something. yeah like, you know thank that? you something. yeah hope you did yeah yeah it's, it's always fun to, and this is a classic i was telling you before i, I used to always have a bottle it's somewhere here it's in a yeah. decanter <laughs> it just said, it says a lot about me that you can't find. You would think, well, hey, I gotta go find a bottle of of bourbon down here. You'd think in your basement you'd be able to find that. I'm like, it's somewhere here. I just don't for, know where I put it. For those of you who haven't been in uh, in Jay's basement, there is bourbon don't, everywhere. There, no, there's not. No, and everybody, no, no, no there's not. Um, <laughs> there, okay, never mind. This isn't my house. This is Josh's colored house. Water. No. Um, colored water. <laughs> There's a significant amount. Um, there's more than, more than, um, well, I'm, I'm, than we probably need. But old granddad was gonna say there's a decanter that I took the like the I told you I take the wax thing off and I always put it on this decanter. It's this fancy decanter. And you pour that in there and like you serve it to people and people love it. And then but when you put it in a bottle, this is not one of the bottles that everybody's like. Yeah dying to get i mean um which is sad because it's great i mean it's it's for the price i think it's like 32 dollars now okay. um not available in every state though like so um, i got this in indiana yeah it used to not be in it used to not be in ohio for i think yeah. probably i think what maybe like four years now josh probably like right before if i can remember like maybe like four or five years ago it wasn't okay. in ohio like so if you went when every time I went to kentucky you'd stop like i would stop in a, a liquor store and buy over right. and then one bring but eventually beam figured it out and uh and uh, Suntory, Beam Suntory, and, and they have it here. And, and it, it, you, when it first came to Ohio, people were, it, it was flying off the shelves. But if you haven't had it, it's great. Um, great proof. The, the 100 is great for mixing. So, Super. Well, thank you for that Cheers, yeah. Cheers. Thanks for having it. It's a new one, so. It is so good, though. Mm. I do like the high ride. It's a nice bite. So, you're an instructor pilot now. Okay. How many how many hours do you have going okay. at the time? Well, let's see. I came out of uh, my first squadron with about fifteen hundred hours. I ended up getting another thousand hours while I was instructing. So you, you know what's going on. You know what you're doing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Know now what now it's on to your next assignment. Yep. Where do you head after that? So then I went to uh, it was um, Air Wing Nine, stationed out of <clears throat> Lamore, California. We deployed on the uh, Constellation, Westpac Indian Ocean uh, deployment. The um, really an uneventful deployment. Uh, so this was uh, early 80s. Uh, we did the before, I think it was right before uh, Desert, or the uh, Desert One debacle. Um, you always offloaded an A7 outfit, which is what we had in our air ranks, that would be an F-18, to in the Philippines, and then the carrier operated in the Western Pacific Indian Ocean. 
uh, biggest thing I remember, so I'm, a, I'm an Air Wing staff guy, and uh, not in the day-to-day -day operations, but coordinating the operations between the uh, uh, helicopter squadrons and the, uh, uh, the S3 outfits. Uh, and uh, just doing exercises, making sure everybody's proficient, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, some great port calls, uh, Singapore, Perth, Australia, you know, places, you know, places like that, the Philippines. So Washington. what makes a good port call? What makes a good port call? <laughs> Lots to drink, you know, the for, what, good port call where you, your, your, your green scoots go a long way. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get a lot for your money if you want to shop and you get it, but you get, uh, uh, entertainment, uh, shopping, if you want to do that, uh, you know, it just, you know, just depends cultural things to do. I would always take a USO, <laughs> I'd take a USO tour everywhere, uh, everywhere we went for the first time I'd, uh, they have USO tours and I would sign up for that to go see all the highlights of that area. And I strongly recommend everybody do that kind of thing. And then if you come back to that port again, go off and do what you want to do based on what you've seen before, go something new. So favorite port call? Good. Yeah, that's a great question. I get to ask that all the time. And I don't have... And why? No. Yeah, no, well, because, that, I, yeah. because, you know, around the world and all that kind of good stuff, you know, join the Navy, see the world. I <laughs> have. Tom doesn't see Josh over there. <laughs> I don't. Behind, yeah. Don't, don't pay attention to Josh. Know, that's what I'm laughing about. You. you stay on track. Josh, stop distracting me. <laughs> <laughs> He has a whole different. Yeah. Okay, you need so, to tell this young man what a real good port call is. It's like I cultural did, I stuff. Did have a, great sightseeing. Have a lady in every port, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's you know sailors and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, but uh, no, that's I, I like the uh, the cultural, the historic, the uh, the shopping, the uh, you know interacting with the uh, the population. Uh, I've been to uh, French officer clubs, British officer clubs, um, just. Interacting with folks, Israelis, uh, oh goodness gracious, Turks. You know, everywhere you go, you have engagement yeah. with the, you know, with the the, the country's military. So, if you had to pick your favorite port, what was it? Well, like, like I said, I want. I found We're something. We're putting on the spot here. We, we, want an, we want an okay. answer, Tom. So the favorite sport in the world. Top two. How about be, top two? Let's see. I really enjoyed enjoyed Israel. Haifa, Israel, because you can go do Holy Land, see things. I got snuck across the border in Lebanon, so that was that was a lot of fun. Um, the French Riviera. Let's go with uh, let's go with Cannes. Okay. Oh, I didn't like the. I loved the Italians and the Spanish. Mallorca. Oh, speak. Mallorca. The, the Palma de Mallorca. What what a party town cultural everybody comes around Mombasa Kenya Mombasa Kenya has the sugar white sandy beaches just like the Gulf Coast here uh, but you have Germans Europeans uh, come down there we were in a hotel there staying and uh, again this was uh, eight right after the Falklands so uh, no right before the Falklands because the Sheffield was there and then the Sheffield was gonna be gone um, and uh hotel we're in was old school European. If they had a message for you, they had a one of the guys coming around, you know, in their their spiffy little uniform with a chalkboard with a message written on it with a bicycle bell. You know, he ding a ling, ding a ling, message for Lieutenant Lennon, you know. That's true. <laughs> Hello. So, like I said, it's. I might have to get one of those made at the house here and be like, yeah. You know, message for Jana. There you go. It just, it's so every place you go has got its own unique things. So, uh, you know, Rome, Italy. I got, to, I got to meet the Pope up close and personal uh, when we were uh, on uh, Kennedy on very interesting deployment. The uh, command master chief uh, had been the sixth fleet master chief. And he arranged for 400 of us to go get a private audience with Pope John Paul. So you come into the Vatican, instead of going left into their great big meeting hall, 
Well, we went right past the Swiss guards into the private residence up to the third floor where he has a reception hall. And I'm second row in, and he's right there talking to us, getting a plaque from the, from the, uh, the command master chief for the ship. It was really what a charismatic man he was. So the eyes just, when you looked at him, he was looking right at you. You know, you know, certain people have a presence, an aura about them. Politicians can sometimes do that. Well, he sure as heck had that. So, so that was pretty neat too. So that's why I say, so hard, yeah. It's yeah. hard, hard to say what a favorite port of all time. Least was. favorite port. Come on. Naples. Wow. Dirty. Now I love Naples because it can get away from it. Go down to the Amalfi Highway. Go down to. Uh, uh, Sorrento, inlaid wood, this drinking amaretto, that kind of stuff. But Naples itself as a city was pretty dirty. Uh, it, you know, there was things to do. You could have fun. But uh, then they have the off-limit area and all that kind of cool stuff. The off-limit. Yeah, off off limit. You can't go past the street. It's like every place. I every think place. every city in the world has an exactly. off-limit part for, for service members, I think. London. Uh, we put, went into Portsmouth. Go go see the tower. Uh, all the uh, the sights in the the British family, the uh, crown jewels, and all that. I'm standing in line to go uh, get into the crown jewels, see all that stuff. And there's an Indian family right behind me. And when I say right behind me, I mean they're they know no personal space you know it's so crowded apparently where they came from and they're all you know just right up against you and, you know they don't use deodorant or <laughs> soap <laughs> so you know after after 20 minutes of that uh i finally said why don't you guys go ahead of me <laughs> Have the crown, I, I wouldn't sell the crown jewel i feel like the one that i saw pub is mostly the way i saw when i went to the uk they were there <laughs> they're, they're everywhere edinburgh um, scotland uh have it haggish all that kind of good yeah. stuff. so you can see i mean 29 years you had magic you have to see tons of places that's really the did. cool part about literally traveling been the world. around the world went through the suez five times because i think the navy really has it like if you're in the navy and you're you're on a, on a ship you're at sea you're seeing like you really are seeing the world like for us it's like see the world that means like go see the, the Bard, sand, the, bardstown you know yeah. california yeah. um poor drum north you yeah. know poor drum new york it's yeah. a little bit different uh different vibe yeah. but uh no, i i I count that as a blessing, the, 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 the travel that I got to do on the government's expense. And then I took advantage of it. When we went to Mombasa, I took a three-day uh, minivan tour to Serengeti, Kilimanjaro, Maasai Village, eight wildebeest, you know, all these wild animals. It's all great. Bless you. So how many years, your 29 years of service, how many at sea? Like, have you figured it out? Seven, seven deployments. Each deployment was six to seven months, but the they all had workup cycles, which would probably be another three months. So at one time, it's, and then other times, and then I had command of a ship, uh, I could navigate, uh, then command of a separate ship. So, that's enough. so probably eight and a half, nine years of actual at sea time. So let's talk about that now. Like, what, sure. so you obviously have a family. Yep. How, how was the family dealing with uh, you being gone all the time and? Well, for a while, it's fine. And then uh, it cost me my first marriage, just too much Navy, too much gone. And again, dad retired as a commander. Some of the advice he gave me was, son, if you want to be successful in the Navy, you got to stay operational. If you're going to stay operational, you got to go to sea. So, which sounded like, and in my mind, <clears throat> going to sea, being successful, you know, advancing in rank, getting command opportunities, can take care of the family. You've got the financial security and all that. When the, when the wife's got to deal with the, the rebellious teenager and all that kind of good stuff, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard load for... Uh, so, so how many years in your first marriage? 22. 22. So we, we on, on Ports of Patriots, we like to talk about this, the tough stuff. Yeah. So what's that like, 22 years, military career, marriage ends... Yeah. What's what? How well, how are you? Was, how'd you deal with that? Because well, another thing about the military is a lot of people don't know is an officer getting divorced is not like the the yeah. greatest thing. No, nope. the greatest and, image. Uh, I was the uh, I'm the firstborn, the oldest in the family, first one to get a divorce. Uh, the the oldest son who 
eventually goes on to become 29 year career in the army drops out of high school in 10th grade and so dealing with all that <clears throat> lots of intervention i'm i'm deployed a lot of this time uh the uh, i got a call uh from uh the wife in haifa we're getting around this is a navigator of the carry at the time and she says uh your daughter wants to get married okay i said uh our daughter is 17. i think the uh, you got to be 18 in the uh, state of florida you got to have parental consent i'm not giving consent are you giving consent she says well no i said but she wants to get married i said well look so i'm in the eastern mediterranean I was fortunate enough that uh, Captain let me fly home because my relief had been on board. And uh, when we got to uh, Spain, he let me fly back to the state, so I got to beat the ship home for two weeks. Got to go deal with that. My, my daughter, God love her, who's very successfully married. She's uh, up in Alaska. She's a school teacher and all that. Her husband uh, restores cars and works for State Farm. Uh, she was. Uh, Every time I'd come home from deployment, uh, what'd you bring me, Dad? Did you bring me Gucci? You bring me gold? Did you bring me, you know, you know, leather? What did you bring me? Uh, very materialistic. And the gent she wanted to marry was uh, going to. She met him at dog shows, and uh, we showed dogs. And uh, he was going to join the army and be an E one, which I had no problem with. But he was going to go to Fort Ord, California, as an E one, and wanted to marry my daughter. And I said that ain't going to work. You're going to the most expensive part of the country on an E-1 salary. You're going to have to pay for a place to live off base because you don't qualify for base housing or anything. Why don't you go do your Army service for a couple of years, get some advancement in you so you can qualify for something. Then I'll give you, I, I have no problem with you. Um, uh, she opted at that point because we didn't give consent, uh, you know, to, she didn't get married. And he went off to the Army and, uh, was in for probably about eight months, and then uh, fried his brain with some uh, hallucinogens. And uh, well, fortunately, I didn't have to deal with that with her. But you know, he, he messed up his life. So, how, what rank were you at that time? I would have been a commander at that time. Yeah. So you're, oh, you're trying to tell some, oh, yeah, you're trying to, oh, you want, you're not, it's not going to work out for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, so let's talk about the son. So you yeah. know, you 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 just went ROTC Army ROTC yep. to make the old man mad. Yep. He yep. dropped out of high school. He dropped out of high school. Exactly. Uh, smart enough and everything, and probably because of teenage rebellions and all that, we tried alternative uh, schools, night schools. Just you know, as I would tell people when I was doing the JROTC program in uh, public high school, you know, you can you can lead the horse to water you can't make it drink and there's some people that you know it just isn't going to work well it didn't work for him and so he dropped out uh was bumming around for a while was living on uh couch in a friend's trailer doing some odd construction jobs when uh the wife told me that we're going our separate ways and so uh i got to make the phone call up to mom and dad say hey you know, here's what's going on uh you know we're uh, we're getting we're going, getting a divorce. And, uh, oh, by the way, the son, I've talked to him. Uh, I was getting ready to go to uh, schooling to go take command of a ship. And uh, I said, uh, we can't, I can't have him there unaccompanied. So I've given him the option with you guys permission for him to come up and live with you, finish high school or get a GED go into the service of his choice. If he gives you any kind of uh, trouble, you know, you can wash your hands of him. And uh, as it turned out, my dad uh, said, yep, they'd raised seven. And uh, my son going to live with them for a year before he went to the army, dad just absolutely worked with him, helped him, they bonded. It was, it was terrific. And I felt blessed, fortunate. Went down to uh, the Navy recruiter. The Navy recruiter says, "Oh, you got to have uh, you know semester. Or, uh, you have to have a uh, quarter of college." Okay, so he signs up these classes. And he's going to be okay. Yep, that's okay. Goes back, shows them. I'm in the PCO pipeline to get to go to my uh, ship, and um, the uh, recruiter told him, "Well, 
Now I mentioned you had to have a semester, about a quarter. We showed you all this and you said they were okay. And uh, I said, well, it wasn't. And so I get this word and uh, turns out the pipeline, I've got, uh, I've got the head of Navy recruiting coming to brief <laughs> me on, uh, you know, uh, on Navy programs for us prospective CEOs. And so I, I talked to the aide and said, hey, I, uh, I need to get a message to the Admiral. I said, here's what's going on in Columbus, Ohio. I said, uh, you know, I don't want a special, you know, uh, interest for uh, my son, but if I'm, if I'm a parent and I'm getting this kind of advice, this conflicting advice from my recruiters, that's not reflecting well on our Navy. And so, uh, uh, I told the son, I said, okay, I'll pay for another quarter of uh, college for you if you want to do that. I said, no. I went down to the Army and uh, showed them what I had. And they said, uh, you know, they said, you come on board. We'll give you 26 weeks of uh, technical school. And uh, and he went and joined the Army, and he took off from there. So it was all good. But I was that recruiter didn't last very long at his assignment. In there. <laughs> so, so back to your son and your dad that, yeah. that year. Have you ever talked to either one of them and asked them, like, what – what 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 was the bond? What just, what changed? It, it just, what changed everybody? What did he need? Or what did I you ever? Dad had uh, he had been very strict on all of uh, his uh, immediate children, and uh, you know, saw most of us pretty successful and everything, but uh, didn't have that warm fuzzy. And I think he just uh, you know he took the grandson in and uh, just wanted to be a more open parent with him and. Uh, they were. I mean, he he helped them with homework. He just uh, took them out doing things. It just it was. I'm off. I'm out of the picture, you know, except for you. Know, but a different dad than you had, right? Totally different dad <laughs> than I had. Dad, <laughs> I tell this story. So I I'd write letters home in college uh, to mom. They were in D.C. and I'd write letters home, tell them how I was doing, what was going on, you know, a little bit about life and everything, just to try and maintain communication. I get the letter back in the return mail with grammatical errors circled in red. <laughs> Your little note saying you could have said this differently. That kind of now. Dad was probably teaching me attention to detail, you know, right? You, that kind of stuff. But I took it as I'm just trying to send you a letter to tell you what's going on. It's a letter from camp, as far as I was concerned. So anyway. So he, so you head off like that time frame. So how were you dealing personally with the divorce? Was it tough on you? Did you kind of see it coming, or uh, probably saw it coming? So you know, it just uh, again, it's it's hard on the spouse. It's yeah. real hard on the spouse, especially when you're gone during challenging times in life. Either you know, early in life when you're trying to get established, and you know, resources, uh, finances are tough, and all that, and all of a sudden you've got to deal with it all. Um, and then teenage years for kids, you know, just just challenging. And uh, so, I have no regrets about my military service because I worked with fabulous people. I had opportunity to do things. I I enjoyed what I was doing, so it wouldn't work. Uh, I I loved life when I was home, but I was gone so much. You know, it. it, it she came from a non-military family, and uh, it was just, even though she'd been in it for quite a while and seemed to be embracing it, it just it just wore on her. And it was too much for her. And that's what happened. And that's what happened. Exactly. So then you're talking about you were heading off to be. The, the, are we talking executive officer well, first? Yeah. We can talk executive off some of these all. I really executive officer is the best job. Executive officer is a terrific job. So, yeah, it's the best job. So we're, uh, I'm number two on the carrier. So I'd been the navigator uh, and uh, I was going to go be the air boss. That's what they were going to assign me. But I'd, uh, I'd been flying the captain of the ship back to uh, New Orleans. His mom was sick and uh, either I flew him or I fly, have one of my squadron pilots fly him, get some training time and uh so it's purely it, training all that was everybody that's right. absolutely and so uh we, we, don't, <laughs> we don't we don't that was all training flights there to figure out how uh, to do uh, that absolutely yeah. you, you got a qualification <laughs> don't matter how you get okay and so uh uh he he's a new orleans native and he was a pretty he'd been the uh military aide to the secretary of the navy uh john layman and uh so he had some pull and all that and uh 
uh, he got permission to take Forrestal up the Mississippi River to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Now, that was a good port call. And he, yeah, like, how does, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, so could you do that today? Yeah. You could, like, yeah. some, they, you yeah. think they would, the Navy would let somebody do that yeah. today, though? Yeah, they probably would. Newer ships are a little bigger. Yeah, they could. So, anyway, but they did. And so I, I took him on a, <laughs> uh, uh, a low level navigation reconnaissance flight right up the river the day before we uh, were going to sail it. The whole world is training, place. everybody. That's all it's training. All training. All training. <laughs> and I mean, oh, it was, that was fun. I mean, you're, you're, you're we did have to land in Marty yeah. in New Orleans to, yeah. to do a, uh, <laughs> so anyway, we're, you know, we're sort of a ground around. recon of the area. And, uh, but, go on back and uh anyway uh and then he they take the ship up we get there and i got invited to go out with the he the exo navigator some of the department heads to a to a dinner you bet i'll do it uh i think i was holding on to the back of the car in my blues outside of the car you know to get there that's how i got there but anyway <laughs> not that us aviators are crazy or anything but uh and so uh we're at the dinner and uh I go to the restroom, the uh, the XO saddles up next to me at the urinal and says, hey, Captain would like you to be the navigator. Would you like to do that? Hell yeah. I mean, it's a much better job than uh, being an air boss. It has a much faster acceleration for other things. More. And so uh, he, he called Washington and said, I want Lennon as my navigator as opposed to whoever you were going to send me. Put him, you know, so I, I bumped somebody, and timing, right place, right time, doing a good job, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I became the navigator. What a great job. Talk about learning how to drive a ship and everything. You're there for underway replenishments, mooring, un unmooring, uh, flight operations, all kinds of good, great stories. Uh, but that was, that was a terrific job. And so then when I got selected to be executive officer, the CO was leaving, the XO was leaving, and I was a navigator. I was going to go to another carrier and be the XO there. So those top three positions for ship handling were going to be gone. And so the captain said, why don't we keep Lennon here as the XO? And so that was my, I had no problem with that. Didn't have to move or anything. So that was my fourth operational workup and deployment on Forrestal. We did our last four. So how big was the Forrestal? Like? Uh, it was the first super carrier. Uh, it was about a thousand feet long, ninety-five thousand tons, you know, two hundred and fifty feet wide at the uh, the beam. How many people? About uh, Forrestal probably had about forty-eight hundred, forty-nine hundred when the air wings embarked. Could push five thousand. So the XO, you're the. I like to say the XO is the city manager. The captain was the mayor to put it that kind of perspective. You ran the day-to-day -day operations. He, he's the he's the boss, he's the figurehead. That's what you want to be, but and he's in charge and you know, he gives direction, guidance and all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, but you know, you're executing the plan of the day, making things happen, coordinating all the activities and you know, you get what you inspect. Uh, you know, you're everywhere. You've got to just uh, pay attention to detail and again, trust your people. You take care of your people, your people will take care of you. I had good department heads. We did some amazing things. So we always see the video the videos or pictures of like sailors hot bunking at tiny bunks. So how big is how big is your, your cabin as an XO? As an XO, you had a suite. You had a suite. You had uh you had a double bed, uh you had uh, you had an office, you had a uh, bathroom, so you had you had pretty good uh you know big as down here i mean it's uh it's a nice good. accommodation yeah you're living good absolutely <laughs> you're not hot bunking with the no, no. <laughs> yeah, with the surface navy really doesn't hot bunk it's submariners yeah. that have to deal with that <laughs> no i know you, you see ate, all the things you kind of they go ate better than we did <laughs> I, I, the navy the, i heard that submariners eat well right well, yeah. well you gotta be kidding me if you're gonna put somebody in the oh, water yeah, you gotta figure something out yeah. Time, yeah it's like no what can we give them that <laughs> they're not exactly. gonna see the sunshine right. um and they got a volunteer, so yeah, that's all a, good. So yeah, I can't understand that the job, but um, so you do the XO. Anything exciting is the XO? Anything oh, jump out? The XO tour, yeah, lot jumped out. 
So the carrier was originally going to be the next training carrier. So we weren't going to deploy anymore. We were going to go to uh, Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Change of command on the ship was 2 August 1990. Easy to remember. It's the day Saddam rolled into Kuwait. The uh, three-star in charge of all naval air forces for the Atlantic fleet, including carriers, was a guest speaker. Shows up and uh, uh, in his remarks says, well, <clears throat> your mission's going to be changing because uh, they're Man, they are, they are surging carriers and all that for uh, Desert Shield. And um, they put uh, 100 engineers on us for a few weeks. And because uh, backtrack a little bit here, the carriers that left, uh, all the A7 air wings, which the Forrestal was designed to operate with, <clears throat> were gone. So, A7 the intruder? No. No, okay. the A7 was the Corsair. Okay, that's okay. Sorry. Light attacks. Uh, the uh, the intruder was the A6, which was I'm close. medium attack. I'm close. I'm close. You were close. Close. I'm one one number off. One off. And so uh, they go. You're 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 going to go. You're going to be the replacement for one of these carriers that's over there in the Gulf. So instead of taking us to Philadelphia, they took us to Norfolk Navy. Every five years, the Navy ship has to get dry docked. This is ever since uh, the uh, the original Navy when they want to make sure that the hull isn't rotten and all that kind of good stuff. They still do that. They put us in dry dock. That's a really neat thing. I got to walk underneath the aircraft carrier, you know, where I'd been the navigator up, see if there's any any dings that maybe I put on it. There weren't, which is good. Uh, that you know, if you're like, I didn't I do that. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a thirty foot long impression <laughs> but the paint paint system was still intact so that wasn't me <laughs> you're like i we know who did that i yeah. love it so uh the key was though to support the uh the fna 18 it required a whole different uh, intermediate maintenance department to support their black boxes and all that kind of good stuff so they had to tear out all the a7 stuff put all the fna 18 stuff in the bigger deal was the forestalls catapults were had to be milled out to uh support the f-18 it had a lower profile and milling out a catapult on a carrier pretty intense operation they ended up doing two of them for time time constraints and all that so they put us in there and uh, we did 10 weeks about 10 weeks in uh, in the yard three shifts a day seven days a week they stop work on the attack submarines. They, I mean, they just, they're getting, they're getting a capital warship ready to go to war. Right. And uh, it's all hands on deck making that happen. So they did 10 weeks. They probably did six to nine months worth of normal work in that time frame. It is amazing what the American industry can do when they put their mind to it. So I'm coordinating all the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on. Okay. Dad, so I talked with the with the captain, Captain Bob Cole, and we talked families and all that. And uh, I told him a little bit about how I was frustrated with Dad and all that growing up. And he says, "Well, you know, Tom, you need to have your dad come ride the ship with us, have him ride from Norfolk back to Maple." So, okay. And so, got in touch with Dad. Said, "Hey, you got an invitation? You you can come ride the ship with us." And uh, I just need you to know. I'm going to be that going. I'm in charge. No, I, was trying to be like, <laughs> I said, I'm going to be going. I'm the boss of you. 12, no. <laughs> 14 hours a day. And uh, you're welcome to stick with me as much as you want, take rest or whatever. And by God, he came out. And he, he, he stayed with us for three days. He was with me the whole time doing everything. And it, it was a huge bonding experience for me and my dad. Uh, I've got a picture on my wall in my basement of he sitting in the uh, couch chair, me with him next door and uh, right next to him. Love it. Did you make him hot bunk? <laughs> no, I didn't make him hot bunk. Did you, Tom, couch. come on, dude. You shouldn't have had it all I, set up. I, I you shouldn't have been like wearing your dry dock, like you're going to build a hot bunk down here. I'm gonna what, my I, dad's going to stay here. I did have him arrested. <laughs> I did have him arrested. I did a security drill with him as, uh, you know, uh, being an intruder, and uh, he, he ended up uh, on the ground in handcuffs. So that, that was good. You're like, take that, Dad. Yeah, That's what you get. Yeah, but I was real, pleased, real impressed that he was able to stay with me and do that. So that was a terrific experience. So we, we got back to Norfolk, or got back to uh, Bayport. We had time for Thanksgiving. We did uh, Thanksgiving weekend. 
and then we we deployed that following Monday out for 30 days to get ready to certify. We did the six month training cycle <laughs> in 30 days. We had overlapping staffs on board the ship doing drills, different drills at all times. It was it was nuts, you know, getting uh, certified to go to war. And we're getting ready to go to combat. Uh, we we passed that. We're we get in for Christmas. We're in for the Christmas break. Right after New Year's, we're supposed to deploy to go relieve a carrier. And uh, maybe it was maybe it was uh, beginning of February because whenever whenever Schwartz coughs, it's a ground offensive of the forty when they just crushed. Yeah, it was fast. The Republican Guard and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, President Bush said, uh, we're not sending any uh, more forces into the theater. And I thought he meant ground forces. Well, <laughs> he's not talking about forces. us. We're leaving the next day. The next day, we are we are going to head, head east to go uh, relieve somebody. We have our West Coast squadron embarked. With the, the, all the food, ammunition is on the ship, we're leaving in the morning. The uh, captain, all the COs of the the surface ships, squadron COs are at the admiral's quarters having a farewell evening. I'm on board the ship as XO to make sure last minute stuff is ready to go. I get a call uh, to report to the captain's office, the secure phone. I did, I went, I'm talking to the chief staff of uh, uh, Air Lant and he says, uh, you need to get word the admiral and the captain you are not deploying in the morning message to follow and uh so sent the uh officer of the deck over to find him and pass that on and uh so we stood down then uh waited for orders and they uh they told us okay you're gonna go over and uh, get the carriers back on a normal six month deployment cycle. We did a seven and a half month deployment, show the flag, a lot of port visits was great, right. but uh, crazy times. So explain that to someone, you know, it's that's hard for someone to understand that has been there. You, you know, the country's at war, you're, you know, you're, you know, fellow, uh, we're ready fellow to aircraft carriers are getting at it, getting at it. You, yep. You're watching the news this happen. Yep. You you think you're going to go and then all of a sudden, you're not going to go. Not. What, what were you? What were you feeling at that time? We we're disappointed. Yeah, absolutely disappointed. Yeah. We trained for it. We really put an awful lot of hard work into it, uh, and uh, met the challenges. We're real proud of what we had accomplished, and then you know the carrot gets taken away from you. Okay, well they're orders, so you follow orders. You know? Yeah, and then uh, uh, like I said, uh, Barbara Bush came down to the ship to visit. Uh, with the crew and uh, thank us for all the preparation we had. Uh, got a nice picture with her. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it was a disappointment. It really yeah. was because, you know, that's, like I said, I, I, I was an anti-submarine pilot, my warfare specialty. I never got shot at that. I never had to drop ordnance in anger, ready to do it, but never happened. And uh, was around it close proximity, but uh uh yeah i was a little disappointed really wanted to be a part of it yeah so you have a crew i mean you, you talked about the crews about five thousand people what, what what is what do you do as a leader because people don't understand that you probably have like 10 percent that are like thank god we're not right. but it's probably less than that I, it would be yeah. interesting but we, you know what well, what, you what know, do you guys do as leaders to get everybody back on track to be like okay you, hey. you tell them the truth you tell them what's happened why we're not going Tell them we're real proud of you for all the job you did. We are still going to go some sometime. We need to be on yeah. on your uh, you know your professional vest while you're on leave. You need to take care of yourself. You need to not let your guard down. Don't uh, don't uh, drive while you're too tired and end up in a car accident where we lose your skill set and lose you. You know yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you, you tackle it just uh, honestly. You know, give them the straight skinny and. Uh, Go forward and you know expect them to do their jobs. So you successfully handled the executive the did, the, the navigator. You didn't punch a hole in the bottom of didn't the aircraft punch a hole carrier. In that. Uh, successfully, <laughs> successfully uh, did the uh, the exo job. You kept the commander out of trouble. Absolutely, <laughs> as an Absolutely. executive officer. <laughs> I got I got uh, again a lot of uh, because I've been the the navigator is helps coordinate getting all the air wing. Ex uh, executive officers and commanding officers qualified 
clotting alongside. That's one of the big things where you, when you go and you refuel, rearm, reload, bringing the ship alongside a, an oiler uh, and keeping it there, uh, you know, takes takes some skill. Like how long does it take to refuel a, an aircraft carrier? Well, typically, it depends on how low the fuel state is. And if, you know, my, my forest oil was a fossil fuel, so we had to take on marine distillate as well as aviation fuel. If it's a nuke, you just bring on the aviation fuel. Yeah. And so sometimes it's uh, three hours. Sometimes it's six. I've seen eight hour. Is that like the old school shooting like a line across? Exactly. Too? Yeah, that, I've always wanted to see that. that, that is, that's got to be the coolest and so, thing. And, and so you, you <laughs> and... You know, you bring the ship in, and you got to match speed, get lined up with her, and you're trying to keep it 140 feet away. And uh, while you're, you know, trotting alongside, for the most time, it's like watching grass grow. You know, aviators, we're used to relative motion. We can see this stuff and all right. that. Well, you can see the relative motion, but when the relative motion starts to creep in, and you're putting corrections to come out and it's not coming out what the hell's going on here and uh you know is the helmsman not because you, you have master helmsman qualified doing the conning when you're doing this <clears throat> but sometimes they miss a heading or something and i'm conning as navigator with uh captain thomasy who was the best ship handler i ever saw and we're, we're creeping in, we're creeping in, we're creeping in. I'm giving commands to go out, go out, go out. We're getting in. And I'm, I'm starting to sweat bullets. I mean, we're we're getting, we're into 120. It's You get to about 100 feet and you get the Bernoulli effect. The suction will bring the ships together. You're going to collide. You don't want that. That's a bad thing, yeah. That's a bad thing. You know, you want to keep the, you don't want to scratch the paint. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to let water in the ship. You know, those kind of things. There's been, Water so, in the ship at the sea is a bad thing. I feel it's like it's a bad thing. I've been, in, I have been in a couple of collisions and uh, uh, seen them. And, uh, so anyway, Captain Thomas, he's he's watching, and he could have taken charge any time, and he didn't. And he but he he was listening to what I was doing and watching all that. And eventually, we start to and ease out. And then you've got to, of course, recorrect to get it back, you know, so you don't go too far because you pull the wires apart that way too. <laughs> And uh, he says, "Well, Gator, that was uh, that was okay, but uh, next time I'm the only one allowed to get the ships that close together." <laughs> Love it. The, the code word of "you really fucked up." But just <laughs> exactly. that's a good way to say it. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, again, you know, he he knew what was going on and all that, and he trusted me. And uh, again, talk about a confidence builder, and talk about a lesson learned, and you know, pay real close attention to that stuff yeah i mean i, I still remember my time in the military is it's definitely if it was safe you had to let people fail a little bit like or almost fail or yeah fly through the flutter a little yeah. bit like you talked oh, yeah. about yeah it's a it's a, it's a good yeah it, but it's always great to get that evaluation after like you think you did something great they're like mm, no <laughs> <laughs> don't ever do that again exactly <laughs> don't do that oh uh, that wasn't good so um you, you, like I said, executive, you know, you finish as executive officer. Executive officer. Come to 1994 when, when I was commissioned. Okay. This is, I mean, right. just throwing out there age wise, in case anyone's wondering at this point. Um, no, I've been in for a long time. Yeah. At that point, you've been in 23 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. You take well, command. So I'd had 18 years in aviation. Then I had uh, about four years as uh, navigator XO. Then I went to the war college. Uh, at the war, I made, I was uh, selected for captain. Uh, and then I was uh, at the war college. I, uh, I'd gotten an MBA while I was a flight instructor. I think I was going to get out of the Navy, maybe go work for Coca Cola. I guess that was 1979. 79. That's pretty good. Look at it. That's great. Tom, what we haven't talked about is Tom, we, we, we were making a joke about it. Tom gave me the most thorough bio I've ever got in my entire life. I always have people send some stuff, and it was like, I opened it up. I was like, "Ooh!" And then he's like, "There's more coming." I was like, "I, I remember showing my wife." I was like, "Holy cow!" Like, I, Tom's making me study this stuff. No, but it, it was great. But it was all the kind of stuff. And and it, it, as you went through it, I had to read a couple of times to get the dates. But it was it was well, you did, some you great stuff. The dates, but yeah. So I was going to. I did the, pretty good on that, yeah, right? You did, I didn't, you so, did yeah, you did. I had to look back at the other. You gave me another yeah. thing that had the dates. I'm like, I feel like Tom is like testing me out here. I'm like, 
I got this figured out. So We're gonna figure it out. So yeah, <laughs> we did all right. Yeah, we figured it out. <laughs> I had to go back and reference some other stuff. I'm like, why the fuck is he making me work so hard to yeah. do this now? Um, but no, you take command of the USS Trenton. Correct. LPD 14. LPD. What's what's an LPD? So it's a landing platform dock. It has a well deck, so you can sink the back end of the ship. Run a uh, Marine Corps Amtraks. You have a uh, landing uh, craft that uh, can float out of it, or then you can raise it up out of the water and it's a dry it's all dry it's a really neat ship and um so yeah i uh i took command of it i didn't do the workup for it uh like you i flew a c5 i flew from uh dover to uh uh egypt and then from egypt down to mogadishu and uh somalia and so i spent about three to four hours on on the base airfield at mogadishu has and have nots no doubt about it third world country <clears throat> and then a helo from the amphibious ready group came picked me up took me out the out to the ship uh spent a week you know turning over with the uh the current commanding officer you know getting to meet the crew and all that kind of good stuff and uh we're sitting there this is right after black hawk down and uh we're there to pull the u.s forces out of somalia i think it was the inchon i can't remember but uh was the lph that was with us but it was um it could not support the uh, Harriers. And so after Black Hawk Down, they wanted the Amphibious Ready Group to have more firepower. So they augmented that uh, air wing with uh, four additional Cobra gunships. So instead of having four, they had eight. And uh, the LPH could support all eight of them. So the decision was made to put all eight of them on the LPD. So I had eight Cobra gunships with the Marine pilots. I had the Marine Recon Platoon. I had the Navy SEAL Detachment. I had a special boat unit. Man, I... You had all the testosterone going on. You had all the testosterone going on. I did. What's the normal crew of the LPD, though? How many people uh, other than with augmented to you? You're probably the, 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 the 350, something like that. Yeah, many 14 officers. About 14 chiefs, that kind of stuff. Much smaller than a carrier. Right. And then was, you take you support 800 Marines. So you're the, you're the first like major ship captain I've talked to on the podcast. So was there any other chance of like you going to carriers, or is that like no, so were no. you upset about what you got? Like were you like I got the LPD? This sucks. I want I wanted to go so to the George Washington the, the, or something like that. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> good question. The tip when I screened for XO, uh, they looked at whether they were going to. Let me be the exo of a nuclear powered carrier or a fossil fuel. They're all nukes now, but they're, they're, they were half and half back then. They looked at my college transcript, and my grades, and the courses I took. They said, "Nope, he's not going to nuke power school because you have to. You have to go do right. nuke power. You have to have the chemistry, physics, math." to be able to do nuclear engineering. So, Tom, do you remember what that Navy RTC guy told you that you need to hire a GPA. He should have told you to hire GPA and you need to go take nuclear physics or something like that. You're like, did you ever find that guy and be like, fuck it. No. Oh, yeah, I love it. But I mean, all joking aside, I mean, commanding a ship is has got to be a complete honor. So I knew that. So I was a fossil fuel. I was fortunate to get command of a major uh, a major ship you usually if you're going to go be a get get a carrier they're going to put you in charge of an oiler uh, refueling ship uh to learn how to drive that and all that kind of good stuff be with the carriers and uh, that kind of stuff so you know how to get them close together and not be not too, yeah. too close anyways, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you i'll give you another story here in a minute but the uh because of all the experience i had going through the uh Navigation school where you do sh simulations, being a navigator. Exco, you've got the simulations again. PCO for the uh, Amphib, I did simulations. On that one, we had a, an air wing commander selected or, uh, that was going to take command of an oiler. And he had just a hell of a time in the simulators with the oiler, just where he just wasn't getting it. But you know, he had to get it because he was he's going to be the he's going to be the boss he's going to be the daddy and he's going to have you know one lieutenant commander underneath him and a bunch of lieutenants and ensigns uh so eventually he got it but uh, i i had no problem with that because i'd had so much experience i, I was right. really well trained to go take command of a ship so so that worked out so yeah so you ready for another whiskey break 
I'll give you time. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll go we'll go over it first. So we we went back to an old favorite of mine. I don't I don't know why. I did, I, I I was gonna switch it up to something different, but I felt like. I did go to an old classic for the people that are that know that are listening, but went with old four shirt. But really, what I went through was another barrel strength, a little bit higher, you know, proof than what you're. Have you ever had the barrel barrel proof before? I'm not sure I've had the barrel proof. So it's good stuff. So. so this is old four shirt we talked about before, um, owned by Brown Foreman. Um, they claim to be the been on the market the continuously longer than any other bourbon, and the first bourbon that was ever sold in a bottle. So pretty wow. you're learning something there. Like there you that. go. Yeah. Um, and it was it was founded in 1870 by George Gavin Bar- uh, Brown, founder of Brown Foreman. Um, it was actually one of the six uh, licensed authorized distillers to produce whiskey during prohibition for medicinal purposes. <laughs> medicinal purposes. I love it. It's always, always a great thing always, if you ever go down there. A yeah. Loophole. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that was a huge loophole. I mean, whoever figured that out was like, this is great. Um, but uh, yeah, Old Forester is produced at the Brown Foreman Distillery in Sh- uh, Shively, Kentucky, and also down at the Old Forester Distilling Company, which is downtown Louisville. I've always said before, one of the greatest places out there, yeah. Whiskey Row. If you haven't been there, it's yeah. beautiful. Um, in 2019, uh, Brown Foreman changed up the program for Old Forester. Um, they used to have just 90 proof barrels, uh, private barrels. They actually switched it um, to enhance the program a little bit better for people. So they uh, introduced the 100 proof um, and they also introduced the, the barrel strength. And if I'm honest with you, we the 100 proofs are hard to find, but it's either like the old school 90 proof are really good and then the, the barrel the barrel proof are, are really good. You can't really beat those. Um, so this one is actually a classic from around here. This is actually, uh, 2020, one of the first, uh, or actually, second, uh, close to probably the top five, where we, where we did teleconference uh, barrel picks because you couldn't go down to the distillery right. during COVID. So this is uh, Jackie of Hearts, which is a great pick. This, this one was um, super high proof, so you got to get ready. You can't you can't chug this one. This yeah. is one thirty. Sounds like no, it's one thirty four point nine. Um, this mash bill is is a classic old wow. of mash bill, seventy two percent corn. Uh, 18% rye and 10% malted barley. So this is a good one. These guys are probably looking forward to having both of them like. Yeah, yeah. So, you ready for it? Yes, I am. Give it a shot. Yes, yeah. All right. 134. Goodness gracious. Yeah, but these are, this is fun. I mean, yeah. this is like, uh, I mean, we try not to get too nerdy on on this about whiskey because that's not the point of the whole no. the whole podcast. But um, yeah, like th- these are. I think you know this is one of those high proofs, but it doesn't really to me. It doesn't taste that high proof. If you want to hand those to one of those guys, they're gonna want to drink you that. Think they want this. Yeah, they'll okay. take it. Yeah, <laughs> they, they're well, definitely they drink really, that. They yeah, they're really quick, quick on that. One, trust me. Um, coming yeah, back. Yeah, that's how you know it's good when they come over and yep. grab it really fast. But um. But I don't think this is like the, the, how the market has gone. Like this is not super. High. It has a lot of flavor too. To me, it's not one of those things where it just like burns your mm-hmm. your throat. It has no flavor. I love these. This Cheers. is the classic one. Cheers. See, I don't think it bites any harder than the maybe maybe a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. It's so okay. good though. Yeah. So good. And if we hear coughing in the background. Now this guy's a professional. If, they, professional. if that happens, we have a problem. Okay. Maybe my dad. If we make, if they make my dad drink it, you'll hear it. Dad, drink that. Take up. <laughs> Do it. My my dad is not a whiskey guy. He, he will partake in the after podcast uh, traditions we have, but he's over there. I don't know what he's doing over there. What is he doing? <laughs> Who knows what he's doing over here? What's he doing? Jack oh, God. he's so important over there. He's checking out the hey, email. He's soldier. checking out the email. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, checking yeah. all the emails he missed while he was gone from. Right. Uh, actually, he's That's probably Florida. reading all the texts that I sent him while he was gone for three months okay. down in Florida, and he didn't respond to him. You know, he just right. like goes away right. and forgets that he has a family. Yeah, it's right. always fun. Huh? On the beach, <laughs> love it. Love it. He, he earned it. You guys earned it. You guys oh, earned absolutely. retirement. I'm not. I'm giving a hard time. So thank you. We like that. So commander stuff. So you're married now. Yep. Let's talk personal. We're kind of taking. When did when did you meet your okay, your current so, wife? All right. Are we allowed to talk about this? Well, yeah. Well, okay. So he's if, giving the if, hand. He's like, I don't know. Well, okay. So I've had two 22 year marriages. Wow. And uh, now I'm in marriage three. Marriage number three. Some they believe you. I never learned, you know, and all that kind of good stuff. So anyway, uh, so I'm uh, my current wife. Apparently, well, she went to high school with uh, 
my sister, the oldest of my two sisters, number four in, in the in line of the seven, and they were classmates. And, uh, and after uh, parted uh, with number two, uh, had us together at a, just a holiday gathering, and uh, we just clicked. Well, it turns out she don't. She met me when she was 14 years old, and I was married to my first wife with kids and all that kind of good stuff. I'd come home to visit the family and everything, and she'd be there with my, my sister, and she was just sort of enamored with me, I'm told, at that time. I didn't know who the hell she was. <laughs> it's a 14-year-old teenager. Yeah. And, um, but anyway, we've uh, she had a, a previous marriage as, as well. She doesn't have any children, and... Uh, we hit it off, and we've been uh, five years at, together. And, uh, so twenty-two is not a good number for time. I told her. I told her I'm good for twenty-two. She said, "Yes, I'm good. trying to do the math, not to be mean. I'm like five. You got to add that up. This that's could right. be. That's, you're safe. That's right. I feel like you I, could be I, safe I on this be. one." She says, "I said, you know, I'm good, I'm good for at least twenty-two. <laughs> yeah, twenty-two is not your favorite number. No, obviously, it's not. it is not. Holy cow." That, I didn't know that. You, you left that, left that in, out. in the seven well, pages. Yeah, you left yeah, that yeah. out. See, I, I got to go into the stuff that you left well, out. There's right. some stuff I'm, that I got to get. Good, I got to go I'm deep. Being honest about I got to go deep. Yep. I love it. So let's talk about the. So, two, like, second divorce. Like, okay. what, like, again, we want to talk about mental health. Like, how are you feeling? I mean, is this like, is it you or is it them? I mean, I'm all joking aside, like, you're <laughs> hardcore still in the Navy. Yeah, I was. And then, uh, and then I, uh, the second divorce was after I've been in the uh, the schools, out of the Navy school yeah, system. Yeah. We got married, uh, you know, did it after 22. So I, you know, had uh, about seven years left in the Navy when we got married. And I uh, uh, met her in Rhode Island. Uh, she was a, a nurse practitioner, uh, an officer in the Navy, and uh, had uh, two children, a daughter and a, a son who I adopted. And um, the plan was I'd retire from the Navy and follow her for her career. Right. Well, I'm on the ship after we got back from deployment and ended up a surgeon to go down to Haiti. And I get a call from the, uh, the Fibron chief of staff saying, hey, uh, your fiance is at uh, Bethesda. Uh, being uh, medically evaluated to uh, be uh, separated from the Navy. I think she has MS. So, well, I'm deployed. I'm not, it's not like I could just jump off uh, the ship. And uh, so I reached out to her and uh, told her, you know, as soon as I got back, we'd, uh, we'd work through things and everything. And we did. And uh, she got medically discharged with a disability from the Navy. She has an autonomic nervous illness, unspecified. We did trials with uh, National Institute of Health to see you know, if she really had MS. It turns out she got something. They don't know what it is, but it affected her. She couldn't work full time and all that. So that, that put the kibosh on me following her being the house daddy uh, and me after I get out of the Navy to do, find something else to do. Right. That's what got me into the uh, JROTC. Well, let's talk about that, that, that her illness real quick. Cause you, if you, if you guys haven't noticed and gals that are listening, Tom had a pretty successful career. I mean, you don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't get to 29 years unless you're doing like Tom said, honestly, like some good breaks, right? Yeah, absolutely. At the right place, right time. And then, but you're, you, you gotta be pretty good at what you're yeah. doing. So, you actually had the chance to become an amphibious ready group commander, which a, a commodore. Yeah, yeah. we, we, we in charge, charge of multiple ships. ships yeah, yep. Yep. and you turned that down because your wife at the time was sick, right? right? Because of this, and uh, yeah. it would mean that I would again have to go to sea a lot, right. <clears throat> workups, deployment, and all that kind of. It would be an eighteen month tour, but you know, it could be a lot of additional stress. And uh, I just, I had lost the first marriage because of too much navy. Right being gone too much so i made the choice not to do it for this yeah. time yeah so like that's one of the things i want to talk about it was you know it what was that like i mean do were you were you pissed off a little bit were you, you know, like because this is where we want to be real about because so, it's hard to explain like you talked about yeah. before 
you don't get to deploy like you're about yep. to take a pretty prestigious Absolutely. you know career Possible like chance yeah. to make an ad yeah and make like what flag. like is there a party uh, that's obviously you love your wife at the time you want to make it yep. work you've yep. you know you had and a so, failed marriage so i took the i took the uh, the issue of the uh, the failed marriage which was too much navy and said okay i'm not going to do it this time i'll sacrifice uh further career you know for family and uh Part of being in the the VS community and the amphibious thing, being selected for being in charge of the three ship uh, uh, amphibious ready group is is a good thing. A better thing would have been to have been a selected for the large deck amphib uh, carrier. They tend to make flag officer as opposed to the squadron commanders, even though they're the boss. Right. They typically don't make flag. Plus, I had not done a uh, a DC tour, a joint tour. And so the chances of me making flag officer, when I looked at it realistically, uh, weren't probably going to happen. But I love the heck what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it's it's always, it's great being the boss, being in command. There's nothing better. There is nothing better. Right. So you pass up. Passed up that being, being the big man, the three ships. It was kind of cool being the so, boss man. And you, you head back here to Central Ohio. Yeah, I did a I become did a, the. They gave me a little bit of time to think about it, and I was a uh, director of training for the uh, tactical training center in uh, Norfolk, where we helped train battle group staffs and that kind of stuff. And then uh, uh, they originally offered me a job at uh, as the professor of naval science in Miami of Ohio. And I said, okay, let's do that. I'd like to be back here. And uh, and then I'm fat, dumb, and happy doing that. And then they called me up. They said, well, there's been a change. We're going to make that billet a Marine Corps billet, not a Navy billet. So we're putting a uh, Marine colonel in there. I said, okay, so where are you sending me? He said, no, nah, it just doesn't work that well. You know, so which school are you going to say? He said, well, these things are all decided years in advance. And so whatever they, while I'm at uh Tech Traeger Lance still waiting for the next cycle. They uh, they had a uh, a need for a uh, professor of naval science at uh, that university up north. And uh, this is what we're laughing about for everyone that's not in this whole weird. You can say love it, hate. Say it's it. Michigan. They 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 act like they nobody in Ohio can say Michigan or nobody in Michigan say, can say Ohio. That's right. They just say they it depends they were, on his wedding, yeah, but yeah. So, so University and, of Michigan. They they offered me the Navy offered me, <laughs> but when the the Navy it's offered closer you, to water though, the school has to approve you. It's not just you don't just get you know here here school we're forcing this guy on you or gal on you, and so the school has to has to approve you. Now Michigan is a prestigious institution. I, yeah. mean, I get I get they're academically rigorous and all that. I. <clears throat> Uh, I don't take anything away from that. I just, you know, it's part of the rival. My dad graduated from Ohio State. They're just a shitty football right. team in your mind, right? Uh, right. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they still have the overall. Even record. though they beat the. Uh, no, it's all yes. right. No. We're gonna we're gonna change that. Uh, I might have a Buckeye. Okay. This is a oh, this cool. is a, I want to put this out like there's some stuff going on my youngest son. You know the Financial Times. He's gonna have to switch universities. So he he's he's been accepted to UC. Okay. And also today found out OSU. So I'm hardcore, you know, pushing for UC. I just okay. can't. I don't know if I can have a Buckeye in the family. It might have to be. He's my he's my favorite. My youngest. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know if I could live having a Buckeye in the house. As much shit as I've been talking about him for all these years, it'll be. But uh, <laughs> well, it's like. It's like I got an army son. I mean, it's the same thing. You know? Yeah, that's you true. I mean, yeah, you're you giving me a different view on it. That's true. It's just, you know, you that's take true. it in, uh, and, you know, whatever you do. But I got to evaluate it has a better engineering program and all this kind of stuff. No, it's fun. I have it's, a daughter who graduated from UC. But I had to throw that out because today it's a big thing. If he's yeah. he, he never listens. I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'll also just say this. Congratulations. Congratulations. Game. Making, okay. He's making some. He's a big man on campus today. Uh, you know. Super. Well, he's got. And I want to get I mean, OSU would be good because he can still live here, right? Yeah. But he's, Save got us some money. he's got choice. That yeah, he's always had choices. Good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's always good to have choices. But have so, choices. what you're saying is, University of Michigan didn't want didn't want you because you're a Buckeye. Well, I never. I told my wife. 
<laughs> but I knew they wouldn't take me. But regardless, <laughs> like I wasn't going to go. I wasn't going to go. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, uh, the next year, the uh, the powers to be said, uh, "Well, we've not had enough uh, aviator." 06 positions in command in the education system. So OSU is going from, is going to be another aviator. And I relieved a, a female surface officer. And so, fine. I mean, so they offered me OSU. I said, I'm done. I'm there. I'm on way. And I loved it. And I did that. And then while I was there, uh, loved what I did. Uh, the first year I was there, I uh, what well, I first got there, I walked into the uh, wardroom and I looked at the uh, furniture that the midshipmen were sitting on. I said, "This stuff's going. I wouldn't let my sailors have furniture like this on my ship. I'm sure as hell not going to let future officers sit on this kind of stuff." So uh, we went out and bought leather furniture, couches, and that kind of stuff for them. And, uh, well, the, yeah, the leather jackets are like. Yeah, it just it was all. Yeah, it, the stuff looked like it belonged on the front porches up on uh, so, Indianola. So, what year is there? I was there ninety-seven to two thousand. Nice, nice. And then uh, while I'm there, I, I realize I'm going to, you know, I'm going to transition out of the Navy. So uh, I joined Columbus Rotary for a couple of years. I was uh, thirteen months before retirement. I applied for jobs all over the place. Uh, the uh, OSU's got a pretty good army mafia to get army officers into uh, uh positions on the uh the, the so how many midshipmen like 2000 were you guys commissioning uh we were commissioning well we had about 125 in the program okay so we were commissioning like uh 25 okay. uh, you know uh, maybe 30 a year so that's a pretty good number though yeah. For, yeah, for, for well like i said there the... were 300 and some in uh, my my class 100 you know, yeah that's, yeah you know, that's crazy we, we weren't at war so that's okay um so love that uh, but then decided again, started to do the, I got off, I got offered the JROTC job. I originally turned it down because I would go and do the inspections. They have to have an 04, or 0, excuse me, an 05 or 06, do an annual inspection when the area manager doesn't do it. So it's an every other year thing. And I would always wrap up the inspection and go shake the instructor's hands and say, Thank you. God bless you. What you're doing, dealing with teenagers. I don't think I could do this. And then, and then, and then, and then Tom goes right. and does it for 18, 18 years. 18 years. So your total years of service, you got to add that on, right? What's the yeah. 29, 18, 30? That's getting there. 40. Then you, you, you figure you're uh, 72, 50. No, no, I'm kidding. What's, what's in the, uh, the ROTC for 18. four years? Yeah, you, can, you don't want to probe that up because people get all mad about ROTC. They think it's like, they just say, everyone, you know, the commissioning, like being an officer is, is always, you get a lot of shit from everybody, but everyone's like, ROTC is easy. Like, it's really not. I hate to tell you that, but it, <laughs> everyone was, acts it, like it is, but it's, it's, it's like, right, it's, it's really not. No, it's but right. um, keep right, telling right, yourself that. Yeah, yeah um, I love it. So anyway, so I did that, and then uh, then I retired. And so then, 18 years, right? 18 years. And, Franklin, uh, Franklin Heights. Franklin Heights of the Southwestern City Schools here in Columbus. Um you try to become a distinguished unit at top 30% of the programs in the country. And uh, we did that 15 out of my 18 years. The other two years we were uh, unit achievement. Um, Real quick, because I, I, you know, I grew up wanting to be in the military. I don't remember JRTC. So what year, what year is it? Do you know when that? Like... 1967. Really? When uh, Franklin Heights was started uh, as a JROTC. So it's been around a while. It depends, but it, you know, it, there's because there's numbers. certain places like I don't remember in New York, like I don't remember there being like JRTC units. Probably because I wouldn't join it because I feel like you're going to yeah. get like harassed and well, wasn't be really good for you. It's all good, but uh, but Texas had a lot. I feel Texas, like Texas the had South a lot. Has an yeah, awful yeah. Lot. There's uh, yeah, uh, there was. Uh, I, I used to know the numbers. I don't remember the numbers, but uh, you know, you cannot have more than one ROTC program in the same high school where you can in a college have more oh, than look at that. okay so you have to either have navy army or whatever okay navy army marine corps gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, okay look at that yeah. you taught me something there, there you go, go. There you go. tell you about whiskey you're teaching about jrtc all right well i, I talked to your otc but so <laughs> I, I knew that i had to do something uh, we had we had a navy chief and myself and drill is big you gotta be kidding me drill me i'm an aviator you know i mean I, I don't drill. And so uh, <laughs> it turns, it turns
work out eventually. I got this fucking kick-ass leather jacket. That's, That's right. not for marching. Exactly. That's for flying pains, buddy. You see that helmet in my office? I'm marching nowhere. That's right. No, I'm gonna... So anyway, but, so you, you do that. You do. I, so I ran a what I considered a well-rounded program. I really emphasized community service with the kids uh, to get them out to uh, think beyond self. Some of that's that rotary philosophy, the daily yeah, yeah. service philosophy. So we'd do that. And I said, you know, if we're going to be somebody, I've got to, I got to do something that covers something for the area. And so I started a, uh, what they call a basic leadership uh, training camp. And uh, that basically was a one week uh, advanced training for freshmen and sophomores to develop the leaders in your program, concentrating on military drill and uniform, orienteering, air rifle. Hazing. Oh, you just brought back a story. Anyway, no, okay. That's a different story. We're not allowed to say that. Let's no. legally <laughs> you want to talk about hazing. Um, it's training. It's it's uh, training we, opportunities. We, we had a... I got word while I was at one of these, uh, and we had like 22 schools, uh, 175, 200 kids, and they, you know, they'd send the best, and we're up at Camp Perry, and uh, word got to me that uh, that night, male and females were going to hook up while they're on the bid watch, you know, get together, and so I've, I have really mellowed from my military days. Boy, I I had the I had the uh, the senior enlisted drag everybody out, you know, get them in the uh, formations around us, and I just rip, went on a tyrant back to my XO day, and I just said, you will not. If you're here to you know make a hookup, you know you're in the wrong place. You can call your parents right now, and get your ass out of here. So uh, you know, I, I I could screw in the overhead pretty good back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> that night I. I screwed at the old head again. Anyway, well, go. go back. Sometimes they need it. That's the way it is. So I had the question. One, one. I mean, we've been flying through. I haven't had to look at the questions that I normally prepare. Um, but there is one I was waiting for. This is so. You got thirty nine years, twenty nine years in the navy. Okay. All, you know, they know hard jobs, right? Yep. Dealing with up to five thousand sailors and yep. officers and all that kind of stuff. Then you go eighteen years as a JRTC instructor, or, you know, professor of military science, whatever you want to call it. On top of that, you have Ohio State. I asked Mike Kelvington this question, who's the current prof okay. professor of military science. What is harder to lead and mentor sailors and officers or ROTC cadets and JRTC? And why? Interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Probably when you get them in the military, they've already taken an oath of office. And they're subject to the UCM chip. And as, yeah. as you, you know, as a commanding officer, you're God. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, let, let's just, let's just not cut any bones about yeah, it. You know? Yeah. When you're the boss, you know, you're the when boss. When you're the boss, you know, you don't want to be in front of them. Uh, for infractions and that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say it was easier dealing with the active duty because I had a broader range of influence over them. He's made, he means punishment. No, I'm, no, no, no. Take away their pay, take away yeah, their, yeah, their yeah. rank. Uh, you restrict them to the ship, that kind of stuff. And, well, uh, I'm, I'm more of like influence. Like, how do you like, do you yeah. like, cause I felt like, you know, yeah. when I, when I was a lieutenant and I looked at a captain, I was kind of like, like after your you know, first couple of years, you're like, "What? Well, I could do this. This isn't hard." Yeah. And then, like, when you're a company commander, you're like, "What the fuck does my battalion commander know? Like, he doesn't know." <laughs> and then, so I feel like no matter where you're at in that structure, there's always someone in the military. Even though they're, you're the boss, they are literally they're gunning for you, right? Yeah. yeah. And I always felt like when I I didn't I didn't feel that way when I was in ROTC. Okay. I was looking at you know guys like. Colonel Donovan, who was our PMS, and I was looking at Sergeant Major Mott and like all these guys. I was like, right. holy shit. Yeah. Like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. Like, now I think back, I'm like, I can do that too, Sergeant Major Mott. He's, he's no, nah, I'm just joking. I, I don't mean that, Sergeant Major, for real. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? I feel like to me, it was like the easy answer would be the younger kids. You have easier to influence. Here's, you know what I mean? Here's one of the things I learned again from when I was XO carrier. 
commanding officer empowered the senior enlisted. Yeah. Empowered. And, uh, you know, and his philosophy was that kid comes to mast office hours and JP. He says, yes, I, I can do all of this to him. I will always allow his senior enlisted, the chief, the sergeant major, the right. master sergeant, you know, that if he I haven't figured out Navy if, rank yet. If, if he comes back to me two weeks, three weeks later and says, I want him off restriction, he's seen the error of his ways. I want him to have his strike back. He's seen the error of his ways. I always tell him, if I take the money from him, the money's gone. Yeah. But uh, if you can get him off restriction, you can, and I tell the kid at Mast, you prove to your chief that you're worthy of his word, I'm going to honor his word because he's really the God to that kid. Yeah. And yeah. That, was a, that was a powerful lesson for me, and I used that when I was CEO of my ship. It would be, it's interesting, but so back to JRTC and yeah. ROTC, any, any of the cadets like killing it right now that, that you know, they talked about it any yeah, of them got, like had like huge careers that you're kind of like, well, I had one of my, I mean, Joe let you down. He became a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope he's, he let us all down by being a Marine. It's okay. We Adam, still love him though. He's, he's, I mean, he did well for himself as a Marine. No, we're kidding. But Captain Adam Klein who's uh, was Navy ROTC, uh, started out as a Naval flight officer, ended up getting corrective uh, surgery of the eyes, went into F-18s. The uh, land by themselves, by the way. Yes, remember that? I do remember that. Test Easy pilot. to fly. He's now a Navy astronaut. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hasn't been in orbit yet, but he flies. He does... Uh, it's just neat the stuff he's doing. So he's in the astronaut program. So that's a pretty successful. Uh, you know what's cool sitting across from me seeing that is like the all that you're uh, that you're uh, the, the all that you are in of him or I don't I don't yeah, know if that's going right. Like it's funny to say like I probably at the same time he was looking at you like holy cow this I, guy's created something now absolutely. you're like he's gonna be an astronaut yeah that's because yeah. uh, I think being an astronaut's like the coolest thing in the world. Oh, I mean really? that's got to yeah. be like. Oh, I Love I mean, it. I feel like if you're telling anybody you're at a bar, you're like, what do you do? You're like, you know, I was in the Ranger Regiment. They're kind of like, oh, I know about that. But you're like, I'm an astronaut. You're like, like, what's the percentage yeah. of people are astronauts? Yeah. Or you yeah. could be like the one guy who's actually a doctor, yeah. the Navy guy. He, he's a Navy. He's in the Navy. He's yeah. a Navy SEAL. Yeah. He's a doctor yeah. and an astronaut now. So this yeah. guy's like a flight. So yeah. I don't even know what's it's going crazy, on. I mean, crazy like, stuff. I mean, I feel like you look well, at him and you're like, I've accomplished nothing in my life. Well, I, uh, Kathleen Sullivan, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan, yeah. who ran COSI. Uh, was in the Navy Reserves when I was the PNS at uh, OSU. And um, she, I had her come out and speak to the bids and uh, her, her uh, program and everything. And, uh, and she said, well, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to get out of the reserves because I just I don't have the time to do this stuff anymore. I said, I said Kathy, you can't do that. You're a national asset. You know, you, you're good for the Navy. Tell you what. Why don't we, why don't I see if I can get you temporary additional duty to OSU for all your drill time? And wink, wink, uh, you come speak to the mids every now and then, and I'll write your fitness report, and we'll be good. She did. I wrote her fitness report. She made captain, uh, stayed in until she wanted to go on. You know, it's... What are we trying to do here? When you have when you have such successful people in the reserves and uh, civilian life, you know, first one of the few women astronauts walked in space and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, you know, you you cultivate yeah. that. You use that resource to motivate others. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's yeah. there's not many people have done that. No. So, Military service, we can talk about this for about two more days. Yeah, we could. Um, I'd love to. Um, Josh is getting a little sleepy over there. I'm kidding. I'm, not, we're, I'm joking. But the I, the one, I want to talk more about like the, the, one of the next next stage of life. So sure. um, before we get into that, um, anything else about the military? I think we're, we I think we're pretty good with it. We, we, you sure? I, you're right. I, we could you're go positive. For, 
because I looked at page seven. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking on your bio. Um, let's get into it. So you, you, one of the things you're into now, like your, that's your, your life. He's wearing the red there. He said he was going to, are you going to switch it out? Are you going to switch it out? Do the wardrobe change. Do All it. Right. He's going to do a wardrobe go. change because we're going to go into phase two. We'll move the mic from him so he doesn't like bang it out with our crack there. We've never done a wardrobe change. We've had a bathroom break before, but he's, he's making it. Josh, help him. He's old. He's old like my dad. Dad, help him. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> dad, help your buddy. Damn it. <laughs> Way to go, dad. Way to leave your buddy hanging. You're, you're... So he's coming back now. All right, here we go. Look at this wardrobe change. We've never had this. We're there. This is good. I like it. So now we're talking whole new whole right. new time here. One, one thing before we do that. We're, are we doing a shot? No, I'm kidding. Oh, I'm kidding. No, I'm too. joking. Uh, <laughs> so before, at the end of my JROTC career, I got to give a uh, shout out. Uh, one of the things that really led me to leave the JROTC program, it was getting close. I was getting tired of some of the entitlement attitudes. But I feel you. Uh, Tyler Gerald was a student of mine. I'd had his sister for four years. He was just about to start his senior year. His mom was the bed monitor in our uh, our school. And uh, he was a young man that was uh, killed in the fireball uh, accident. Uh, he had his girlfriend out there and uh, where the uh, car detached went. And just a real fine, fine young man. He just recently sworn into the Marine Corps. And that one hit me pretty hard. It just, I mean, I... You know, they pay us flight pay. You know, I've dealt with accidents and that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, getting, I was getting more seasoned in life. And uh, I got to do all the media interviews for that and everything. And uh, that just was uh, was tough. So anyway. I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up because we're going to we're going to dive into it more before we get into this. So I, I had a question here. It was like, you know, you, you obviously share with the, the audience tonight and also in the bios that, you know, your first carrier landing you saw – the guy die, right. and then you know you, you shared in the bio that you you, you know you you've been around death oh, before, yeah. so what was different about losing this young kid Probably, than you've seen before? What like what you know why was it different than before? Good, like good question. So, um, uh, just at the start of life, you know that uh, you know <clears throat> parents don't ever want to see their kids pass before them, you know, for accidents yeah. or anything like that or illness. And uh, for a tragic accident like that, I mean, he was going to be a Marine. He was uh, uh, studying uh, cyber uh, security and all that kind of good. It just had a, had a real promise to him. It was just a fine young man. And, uh, and it was just a tragic accident. And uh, was it preventable? You know, hindsight, yes. But uh, it had passed inspections and all that kind of good stuff. And it just, uh, you know, I... I <clears throat> I've always faced those kinds of adversity with faith and the fact that uh, things happen for a reason. Not sure what I did. I appreciate the reason, but yeah. uh, they happen for a reason. And uh, that's allowed me to not dwell on some of the negativity and try and focus on the positivity. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's hard when any young person goes, but yeah. Oh, do, do you think any like do you think any of the past losses were projected on him as well? Could have been, but I I really don't think so, yeah. I, because I think I, I deal with those individually. Like I said, Stephen Fink, uh, I, I don't remember the names of a lot of the squadron mates that I served with and all that kind of good stuff. And then the students, a lot of times uh, I probably served with 3,000 high school kids over the years. And, uh, you know, some of the names I remember, most of them I don't. Yeah. I love it when they – I just uh, – my brother's uh, wife's family has a compound at Indian Lake, and they got hit by the tornado. And uh, we were up a couple weekends ago cleaning up, and that was my first time I'd ever been where a tornado had directly touched down. Oh, my goodness. And um, one of my nephew's friends came, pulled up in a truck to help, gets out, and uh, nephew Mike goes, hey, Uncle Tom, I'd like you to meet. And he, he goes, I know Captain Lennon. Okay, I'm looking at him. I'm trying to place the face. And he was a former student in Franklin Heights, the JROTC program. I had both him and his sister. As soon as he told me his name, I knew who he was. But, you know, it had been years. You know, you know how we transition a little bit in life? Yeah. Change our 
physical appearance, but he remembered me, and uh, you know, I remember who he was once he told me his name, his sister. So yeah, we're gonna okay. have to show you a picture of Joe okay. after this to yeah. make sure so we get the true Absolutely. story about Joe since he's not here. But um, so you transition to you, 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 you're wearing the red now Wear for, red. for the, the veteran, yeah. He's wearing the red. He's doing it. So how, you, you, he's now you're now heavily involved with the veteran Com companion animal services VCAS um, up in Delaware, Ohio. Yep. Um, I'll turn this over for you to have a chance to talk about uh, yeah, the organization, um, what they're doing. So veteran companion animal service, current wife, after I retired, wanted to, she's always had a love for dogs, had a dog walking business and all this kind of good stuff and said, wanted to have a little more appreciation for the military because she didn't do military with me. And so she sought out this, found this organization, said, hey, we need to go volunteer. So we did. And uh, initially I'm doing nothing and uh, so I'm not sure I'm going to stick with it. Then they had a little reorganization meeting and I got involved in the phase called uh, Patriot Affairs. So I've got the best job at the organization. <laughs> the organization's mission is to put rescue dogs with veterans who are seeking the companionship structure and mental health benefits that these god-given creatures give us um, it's all about tapping into the human animal bond there's a whole research institute that talks about how animals and humans interact and how beneficial they are to us dogs have unconditional love for their families. Unconditional. And so many of our veterans who are struggling with PTSD, uh, loss in family, uh, loss in where they are in life, not being able to transition, have been able to find a renewed sense of self through this program. So veteran applause. Any veteran out there can apply for a dog and if you have a dog we also offer a seven week basic dog obedience training to any veteran for free for free exactly yeah. so veteran applies i get the application i'm in charge of the patriot affairs so i i call every veteran that applies whether they're going to get a dog whether they are in our service area we currently service about 100 miles around central ohio we'll stretch it a little bit um Go over the application with them, you know, demographics, where you live. We don't care, you know, if you're an apartment, if you own a home. We love it when they have their own home and they got a fenced in yard. Well, that's not 90% of veterans. So it doesn't matter. If you live in an apartment, as long as they allow dogs, we'll work with you. You fill out, tell us uh, characteristics you're looking for. We say, okay, we deal with rescue dogs. We can't guarantee you a breed. Sometimes we find the breed that you're looking for, but we'll find you the size of the dog you want, the personality of the dog you want, characteristics. Go through all this. Do you want big, small, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, I also have them. So once we finish that phone call, I said, I'm going to send you an email. In that email, I want you to send me a copy of your DD-214 black out your social i just need to see that you serve that's I'm a, we're, i work for a non-profit whose mission is to serve veterans and that's how we do it oh by the way if you're a national guard and you're currently serving you don't have a dd214 you can show me a cat call I'll make right. this work um and if you don't want to mail it or send a picture up when you get together personally you can sell it to me um we then uh have them fill out the ASPCA meets your match dog survey, a doggy dating site. Yes. Yeah, I never was able to do that in any of the dogs I've ever had. Yeah. Well, I didn't know about it. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking for my my soul dog. I don't, so, so we. Um, it, 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 I love it. He or she's out. She's out, actually out there. Jane, she knows who she is. All right. Good. Jane's my soul dog. Your soul dog. I love it. So anyway, they uh, they fill that out, and then we take. Their application profile, that uh, meet your match, which gives a, a colored dog, mm -hmm. orange, green, purple, red, whatever. And uh, we give that to our shelter partners. We currently work with uh, Humane Society of Delaware County and Gigi's Animal Shelter in uh, Canal Winchester. 
Both of those shelters are no-kill shelters. So and we give the, our veterans the right of refusal anywhere along their way. So we take that information. We find a dog. It may take a while. We find a dog. And, oh, they have to come to an interest meeting, 45 minutes, at our office. Anybody that comes to that interest meeting jumps ahead of any applicant that I have who has not come to uh, an interest meeting. We want to see that you put a little skin in the game. Once you come to that interest meeting, then we start looking for a dog. We're also going to do a home visit. I tell them it's not a barracks inspection. We want to see where the dog's going to eat, sleep, and get exercise. Get the word. Get exercise. You can't, a dog is not a cat. You can't leave it unattended 24 hours. It needs to be exercised. <laughs> Yes, sir. Tommy, the funny thing is you can't see Josh the way we're he's a cat guy. He's like, that's right. He's a cat guy. He's like, that's why you don't get a dog. That's right. Well, that's that's just it. But that's, I know the pain, man. I got, what, I got but that's what our our veterans need is that structure. Yeah, that's dog, a, yeah. The dog dogs your 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 battle buddy. Yeah. You know? You've got to take my, care mine of are though, if I'm if I'm honest yeah. with you. Like, I mean, there's like five minutes a day that maybe they're my battle buddy. I'm like, yeah. Solid five minutes. I'm I'm with them. I love there. them. And then I'm like, well, that's not true. Because you, you're, you, I mean, this is one thing to say about you know. It, the, it, Josh has put the stuff up on the mission stuff. The he's got the the link up to uh, Vcast right now. www.vcastcharity.org. Uh, um, there's a post that's coming up. I, I have that ready to come out for about that. It's got a cool, good picture of Tom in the red. He's sporting the red. But this is not a service. Like the big thing about this isn't like a service. These aren't service. They're not service dogs. dogs. Yeah. No, these are, are dogs companion, just like companion dogs that companion are like. Companion animals. And, uh, we, you know, you yeah. have emotional support animals. Exactly. And all that. Yeah. We do not, we will not, we're not able to certify, but every dog we place, right. I, I got stories like crazy of, how these dogs have helped people and especially PTSD and all that kind of good stuff. They don't have to be a service. Yeah, that's, I just want, but let, let's do that. Let's like, so that's what well, I just want to make that sure that they're not service dogs. These are dogs that like, they need you just like you need them. So that's win, exactly win. what to put it. Yeah. Exactly. And, and they, the, the, the tagline that I saw, like I'm familiar with a lot of guys at VCast, you know, you're probably like the fourth person I've met from a, it's a great organization. I, it's, it's super exciting. You're the second guest who's involved um, that's been on the po the program, but like the, the, the tagline, we rescue dogs to rescue, rescue. veterans. is true. Exactly. Like this is, these aren't service animals. These are companion dogs. They need it. They need a fan. They need, they need a home and you need a friend. This is a great thing. It's a great organization. So um, they're doing great things. Check into it. So tell us a story about how your, your, your most important story of where you've seen most that of, truth story of I've, like, I've we got, rescue dogs, they rescue like veterans. Favorite port. I can go for multiple stories. Yeah. So I'll give you one. Uh, John Grimm, former Marine, uh, had recently been divorced. Had a three-year-old daughter. Was driving trucks locally. Um, Kroger for Target, that kind of stuff. Uh, daytime, he wasn't cross country, he was local. But he was working like uh, noon one to two in the morning, six days a week, no social life, no nothing. Just uh, really feeling down on himself. Uh, his VA counselor actually brought him to one of our interest meetings where we talked about our program. He came in, we, we met right ahead of time and everything because nobody's gonna be able to help me. So well, hopefully we can. We explained our program. That night he filled out an application. He hadn't even filled out an application. He showed up at this meeting. And uh filled out an application. Uh a few weeks later, uh taking him to uh a training session, what we thought was a training session, met him at the VFW post in uh, Delaware. And uh they had uh, canceled the meeting for his 4th of July or something like that. And anyway, wife and I got to talking to him, and he was just, you could tell he wasn't mentally well. So we said, hey, John, let's uh, let's go get some dinner. So we took him out to dinner and just let him unload, let him talk. And you could tell he was really on the edge. And I said, John, I can give him my word. We're going to find a dog for you. I can't tell you exactly how it went because it's got to be the right dog for you that beats what you're looking for. Wasn't too long after that, we found Basil. Basil is a uh, 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 
black black you see how the world goes basil hayden okay, there you go basil hayden. Hey, this I is six degrees of separation so show no picture give him a little video our veterans have the right of refusal he could say no and then we start we look for a different dog he said yes let's put it in foster we always put the dog in foster for two to four weeks let the dog chill out out of the shelter environment mm -hmm. and uh and then about uh, this case, week three, we had John come meet the dog. He brought his ex and his daughter to meet the dog. That dog came right up to him, run up to him, jumped on him, hit him in the nuts initially, but that's okay. And uh, <laughs> he said, "This is this dog's for me." And uh, you know, he interacted. The daughter interacted. The dog was great with the family. We we try to screen that kind of stuff ahead of time, especially if they have kids or other dogs. Uh, so they're compatible. John wanted to take the dog home that night. I said, no, you can't do that because we want you to really think about it. I'm going to call you tomorrow. And let me know. And so I called him the next day. Yes, I want the dog. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I will bring all the supplies, you know, that you're going to need to take care of the dog. Crate, bedding, leashes, food, toys, treats, harnesses, uh, grooming supplies poop bags everything you need to toys take care of that dog we give them before we bring the dog into it. bring the dog the next day if they're if they're 100 miles away i'll do it all the same day but uh, the foster will bring the dog to the veteran we take happy snaps john was elated he actually did a piece for uh the uh Columbus Dispatch and also uh, did a tape TV piece at, uh, down the road and said if it wasn't for Basil, he would be a statistic. And that's, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's had me, keeps me going in this organization. I'm a four and a half years right now and I've done a bunch of these and I've got similar stories. We don't care what your circumstances are. As long as you can take care of a dog, that because we're looking out for the dog's interest also. When you take care of the dog, we're going to find you a dog. We cover all the costs for the first year. Adoption fee, licensing fees, all of the supplies, all the food, all the treats, the seven-week training program. 11 months in, we'll check up on you. 11 months in, we'll uh, tell you, hey, you're coming up on one year. How about putting another food order in so you have a good start to the next year? I mean, that that first, we have them go, take the dog to a vet within two weeks of getting it. Dogs are all healthy. They're microchipped, spayed, neutered. But we want you to establish a bond with a, uh, a veteran. We want you to get your flea and tick medication, which is expensive. We'll cover that for that first year. Year comes up. Do we cut you loose and you're on your own? Nope. We do quarterly uh alumni programs anybody that either goes through a training program with us all veterans who get a dog go through the program any other veteran who wants to go through with their dog to refresh your training basic obedience their alumni will invite them to picnics sporting events zoo wild lights just so that they can talk with other veterans and feel a sense of community and camaraderie what a wonderful organization. Always looking for foster families. Always looking for corporate sponsors. Yeah. Jana, we can't do that. My, 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 that's the thing I'm saying. Like, do not, Tom, don't say that. Because my wife's going to be like, this is a better, we should be fostering kids in here. So what I'm hoping is Tom can take my two dogs there and give go. them to a good fit. No, our, gonna... our fosters are only for two to four weeks, not long term. <laughs> Just take them. Take them. No, I'm kidding. Um <laughs> The dogs are the kids. <laughs> I mean, oh, there you go. I, I no, I hundred percent feel it. It's just like I, maybe I should feel out, fill out the. I'm gonna fill out the survey. What was my yeah. like dream dog? All right. I don't want a hyper dog. Yeah. I'm hyper enough. Yeah. I just want a dog that like when I sit down, I just want like I just want to pet the dog. I have a cat. I love cats. See about it. Yeah, I want to pet. The cats are assholes, though. They they only <laughs> well, want to. Be, I want a dog that just like sits there. They pet it. it. Like I just want. You know, I don't. I don't know what I want from a we dog. Call, we call them, I just don't want my dogs. No, I'm kidding. All right, we we call them Velcro dogs, where they just want to be up against you and just you know, get uh, get caressed. But then that gets too much at times. Also, yeah, I don't know. Like I got to fill that survey and see what my dog, my my uh, 
my spirit dog is. Right. I, haven't, I haven't had a spirit dog in my so, entire life. So but. you want to do the ASP? It's ASPDA beatyourmatch.org slash dog survey. Josh is going to put that up. He's, he's, he's over there hanging out. But no, all joking aside, it's a great great organization. Like I said before, one of the key things, if you didn't pick it up from Tom, is it's free. They're going to match. They're going to find what you need. Not that this is, you know, and again, what you need and what the, do, yeah, what the dog needs. You can get out of it anytime you want. Um, it's a win-win situation, actually, yep, right? Absolutely. You're creating a win-win situation for all involved. For all involved. And it's it, uh, no joke aside, and it's really like the rescue dogs, the rescue veterans, which is important. Like everybody, this organization in Delaware, it's, it's really well known. Um, we're I'm sure there's other places. We're, getting, we're relatively yeah. new, but yeah. we're, we're getting better. Yeah. Now. But yeah, I mean, it's it's known in the area. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people that, that that believe in. I I feel bad because I always make jokes about dogs, but I mean, my I guess I'll say it. I do love my dogs. They went for that five minutes. That five minutes of my my calm is important. But uh, I I can't thank you enough for continuing to support us. It's, it's interesting to have somebody on here where twenty nine years, eighteen years, yeah. four and a half years of yeah. what I consider to be service to others Absolutely. and and you know the the country and the community. So Tom, that's pretty thank you, pretty admirable. I appreciate and, and, uh, and, the opportunity of coming and chatted with you and drink yeah, a little it's, bit of your it's whiskey. My, it's my first uh it's my first wardrobe change of any, but it's, it's awesome so i just have one more question because sure. we talk about we, we talk about before we get it to and we are running long and again like the great thing about being in charge of the podcast is nobody has control except for me so right. i don't care but um one question i have we, we started adding this in is like you know you're you're a veteran you've been in the community for a long time you've seen you look i mean all joking aside a little bit older so PTS has been around for a long time. It's just in different, mm -hmm. been called different things in different yeah. forms. So right now with what you're doing and what you've seen with all the focus and attention that's on veterans, mental health, what is not being done that needs to be done? Being done that needs to be done. <clears throat> I would like to see the VA come up with a program where companion animals are part of the VA's program because the VA only works with service dogs right now. I think there's uh, maybe some movement afoot to do it, but I mean, you've got programs out there with horses, yeah. with dogs. Uh, so I mean, but the human animal bond there, we are all connected in a way. And I'd like to see the VA somehow come to maybe support organizations like VCAS that mission is to help veterans and to help rescue dogs. And uh, I think, again, we're happy doing our part. You know, it's, it's a labor of love. We've got some wonderful, uh, you know, supporters and donors, but, you know, if we could, uh, I, I I've seen the impact that just a regular dog has on veterans who need that that love and support. Yeah. Now, I think it was the conversation we had before. It kind of ties into it before the podcast is, you know, there, there's like the horse therapy. There's there's so many different. It, it, it just depends on like what works for you. For like you, you got to keep searching. Like, yeah. you know, if, yeah. if like if counseling is good for you, then then yeah. get into counseling. If like riding horse you know like the horse therapy is good for you getting a dog is good for you like d just keep keep like dipping your toe in the water that right. works for you like eventually something's gonna be the thing but there is definitely a tie-in between like nature and animals with that whole thing and i think yeah. you know i think it was you that talked about before but i've also talked to kevin um gad about this is like with other people is like there's been a you know one of your one of your alumni or, or people in your program that like it, they, they even said like if it wasn't for me having to take care of this dog yeah, I wouldn't purpose. be here. Like, the, so that, they, so it, and, and if that's something that keeps a, yeah. a veteran alive or yeah. a first responder or fireman, then yeah. dude, that's fucking important. Absolutely. Like, whatever keeps that person we don't need alive is what we need. Yeah, anymore. Yeah. And, and, and I want to say that that that's not drinking and that's not doing yeah. that stuff. It's like yeah. healthy stuff. Like, you just yeah. got to keep pushing it. And yeah. like, organizations like VCAS is it's huge. Um, you know, it, you guys are a small five hundred one c three like us, but like. I'm still super proud of what I'm doing. Yeah, I know absolutely. I'm super proud of what you yeah, guys are doing. Exactly. I'm, I'm, 
you're doing it's great to, it's great to, it's great to you know to see organizations because it is making a difference it, yeah. it, you know it's not the big scale that we see all the time but it's making a difference in that's, someone and that's yeah. and that's what we need to keep doing so that's a great thing so um tom thank you thank you Jay. Thoroughly pleasure to meet it. you it's a pleasure to finally meet you we're trying to figure out how you got here we figured it out eventually, it's eventually. Right. it doesn't matter how you got here you're yeah, here right we're here. <laughs> Appreciate which is it. awesome so good luck with uh, continued success with your operation your podcast i appreciate that and, and uh the same thing with what you guys are doing at vcast and i'm sure we'll be working together we got some plans to work together here in the future so i'm excited Super. about that so um we're gonna get to the the not so great part of ports of the patriots tonight we're gonna honor a um veteran who um unfortunately took their life tonight we're gonna honor u.s navy seaman um xavier hunter mitchell sandor 19 years old Xavier Vern took his life on April 15, 2002 in Newport News, Virginia. Vern was born May 26, 2003 in New Haven, Connecticut. Vern had a passion for sports. He started martial arts at the age of five and through many years of hard work, sweat, and dedication, was able to earn his second degree black belt in karate. Vern was also the quarterback of the Shelton High School football team. Vern graduated from the Shelton High School in 2021 and enlisted in the United States Navy. Um, Vern attended boot camp in Great Lakes, Illinois, and A school in San Antonio, Texas, where he graduated as a badge master of arms. Vern was stationed on the USS George Washington CVN 73 at the time of his death. Vern cherished the warmth and love of his devoted family, especially their Saturday night dinners and annual family picnics. Vern will be greatly missed and will never be forgotten by those who were privileged to know him. He is survived by his parents, John and Mary, brothers Gregory and Patrick, grandmother Mary, um, Uncle Pat, Aunt Susan, his mother Heather, his canine companion Grace, and numerous other relatives and friends. So if you or someone you know is in crisis and might be considering suicide, please contact the Veterans Crisis Hotline at 988, press 1, or 1-800-273-8255 and press 1, or you can now text 838-255 or chat online at veteranscrisisline.net forward slash chat. So uh, again, Tom, cheers, yeah. I guess how about, yeah. uh, how about this young man? Yeah, it's young crazy. Man. Like 19 years old. This is like a hit hard and uh farewell shipmate. Yep. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. So again, Tom, thank you. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming here. Thank you for sharing your story. Most importantly, for everybody that's listening, like, thank you for your service. This is like a ton of fucking years. <laughs> <laughs> you're in and like and you've been through a lot and and, and um we'll have i'm to get, honored to share a story we'll have to get together and share some more stories <laughs> yeah we will <laughs> we'll be, we have a little bit after this but you're always welcome so, so um come see us anytime you want uh, bring the vcast boys we got to do one final plug we, we got our charity uh our, our first annual um charity coming up awesome cornhole tournament you guys won't be here because what we just found out is you guys are having your gal yeah. on the same day we were talking about this didn't work out so every time i see this slide i laugh because my son did a, a promo for this way better than i ever did i'm gonna have to post it someday but zaftig we're in the shirt tonight we're gonna have our, our um first fundraiser here at zaftig may 18th 12 to 9 p.m cornhole what? lots of money to be right. be had the people I know that signed up right now are shitty cornhole, po uh, sh <laughs> shitty, shitty cornhole players. So you have a good chance to win. First place prize, five hundred dollars. Second place, three hundred dollars. Third place, one fifty. I have to tell you, we have some kick-ass um, silent auction items that are coming up. So you got to come down to the. That's gonna be better. We're gonna have food truck. Rumor is we're gonna have gelato. A gelato truck down there. there. That's the rumor. New one I dropped down um we're gonna yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a good great beer at, at zaptic by friends at zaptic um come out and see us if you need to get tickets get them we have some slots that are still open and come see us you don't have to play cornhole to be part of it but you definitely need to come down we i'm like i'm not kidding around with some of the uh, silent auction stuff we have um it's gonna be pretty special so um Good sorry luck. we can't make your gala yeah that's sorry, one thing I I found out. we were program. talking yeah. to the ceo of okay. the, your organization we're we're look at our we're, we both got our calendars we're like oh that's not gonna work out but <laughs> um but again thank you tom i can't thank you enough for your service thank you for for uh coming down here thank you for taking a leap of the faith to come down in the basement no problem. and uh see glad I did. i'm glad you did too as well so 
everyone that we're going to close episode uh, 53. We will see everyone in a couple weeks and have a great night. Thank you much.